I'm David Marinick. Before I introduce Heather Hyde Minor, I would like to thank the organizations that have made this symposium possible. First, the Notre Dame Rome Global Gateway and its former academic director, Professor Hyde Minor, who was an initial and enthusiastic supporter of the original idea more than a year and a half ago, and the current director, Silvia Dallolio, and the staff who have supported these last several months that have made this really possible. The Nanovic Institute for European Studies at Notre Dame has been a generous supporter of the event from its inception. And my School of Architecture is the host for the event, for this webinar, and is supportive of the idea of a future documentary based upon it, about which please stay tuned. Finally, the, school, uh, the, um, uh, the American Academy in Rome uh, has sponsored this event, and they've been collaborative through this very challenging last year with transitions in leadership and all the things that we know about in the world. The motivations for the symposium were several. To consider Raphael's influence in the past and how he might also be relevant today and in the future. Apropos the Nanovic Institute, there is the idea of academic art that we owe to Raphael, which was really a pan-European phenomenon uh, and involved a shared culture with, with local inflections. This is also a rare opportunity for scholars and practicing artists and architects me in particular, <laughs> to present and discuss shared themes and ideas. Now, the past may be a foreign country, as some have said, but for expatriates like me, at least you can learn to live there, <laughs> although it's always harder to go home the longer you stay. So now it's my pleasure to introduce Heather Hyde Minor. I first discovered Professor Hyde Minor through her writings, then eventually as a friend and finally as a valued colleague. She is a professor in the Department of Art, Art History and Design in the College of Arts and Letters at Notre Dame. She's a specialist in the history of European art and architecture from 1600 to 1800. Her scholarly interests include the city of Rome, the intellectual history of art history, and prints and print culture. Her most recent book, Piranese Unbound, which she wrote with Carolyn Yerkes, Yerkes came out in 2020 with Princeton University Press. She has been the recipient of fellowships from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Humanities Center, the Samuel H. Kress Foundation, and the Sterling and Francine Clark Art Institute. Her book, The Culture of Architecture and Enlightenment in Rome, won the 2010 Helen and Howard R. Marara Prize in Italian History and the 2013 Honorable Mention for the Alice Davis Hitchcock Book Award from the Society of Architectural Historians. So I'd like to turn it over to Heather Hyde Minor. Thank you, David, uh, and welcome to, to After Raphael. Today, thanks to uh, Professor David Marinick, we get to stand in Raphael's shadow, uh, which is not a cold and dark place. Instead, it seems to me that we get to luxuriate in the, in the dove gray silhouette that he, that he cast. He inspired such a broad range of appearance from the German Nazarenes to 19th century American robber barons and from Bernard Berenson to Pietro Bembo. How did Raphael's legacy move across time and what does he do for us now? These are the questions that David and his erudite speakers will answer for us today. Before we begin, I'd like to say just a few words about the University of Notre Dame uh, Rome Global Gateway, which opened seven years ago. Scholarship and creative work undergraduate and graduate education are the essence of our mission here. The Gateway supports research conducted by undergraduates, graduate students, doctoral fellows, faculty departments, centers, institutes, and colleges at Notre Dame. We partner with a wide range of Roman and Vatican institutions, including universities like Tor Vergata and La Sapienza, as well as others like the American Academy in Rome and the Apostolic Vatican Library. In this work, we follow in the footsteps of our colleagues in architecture who have been teaching in Rome for more than 50 years. One of my goals as academic director was to foster research collaborations between the Gateway and the School of Architecture. So I was thrilled when David asked for my support for a conference to celebrate the 500th year of Raphael's birth. Rome is the perfect setting to bring together scholarship and creative work, and I'm very grateful to David for doing it. Uh, 
head of state. <laughs> Maybe we should all go out for a coffee. Um, but I, I think I'll take advantage of this opportunity because one of the things I, I do hope, and this is an invitation to my, my fellow panelists and also to the audience who's watching this wherever they are, um, that we, we have an opportunity for a bit of dialogue at the end of the presentation. So before we have a break, we have a, we'll have a break uh, after the first three speakers. So before that break, there will be an opportunity for discussion among the speakers and maybe taking some questions. At the end, after the last two speakers, of which I will be the last, uh, we'll have another kind of discussion and then again an opportunity for questions and then some final thoughts. So if we do get a little bit ahead of ourselves, hopefully it'll allow us to make up some time and have a bit more time to actually have a conversation. Um, this, was, this was meant to be a symposium. This was originally meant to be an event that happened last year, the 500th anniversary of Raphael's death. Um, we are a year later, so it's 501. Um, that gives added meaning to after Raphael because it's after the anniversary. But it, it's also an opportunity, I think, for us to think through what it is that we can do with Raphael going into the future. And as much as that, that idea is informed by the past, it's also something to which artists, I think, have something to contribute. And so the idea here is that we've assembled scholars and artists and about Raphael, I think we can actually have a conversation. So I'm very much looking forward to that. So now it's my pleasure to introduce my colleague, um, companion here in our villa um, at, at Notre Dame in Rome, Ingrid Rowland. I was lucky to meet Ingrid Rowland when I was a fellow at the American Academy in Rome, where she had been a fellow just a few years earlier. And it's been one of the privileges of my life to get to know her and her scholarship over the years. Professor Rowland holds positions in both the School of Architecture and the College of Arts and Letters at the University of Notre Dame. She writes and lectures on classical antiquity, the Renaissance and the age of the Baroque, and much, much more. <laughs> <laughs> After completing a BA in classics at Pomona College, she earned her master's and PhD degrees in Greek literature and classical archeology span at Bryn Mawr College. Before coming to Notre Dame, she was an associate professor of art history at the University of Chicago. And before that, she taught at UCLA and Columbia University, as well as in the Rome programs of St. Mary's College and the University of California, Irvine. Ingrid Roll has been a fellow of the American School of Classical Studies in Athens, the American Academy in Rome, the Villa Itati in Florence, and the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. She's a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences and a corresponding member of the Academia dei Sepolti of Verona of Volterra and the Academia degli Intronati of Siena. Few can say that. A frequent contributor to the New York Review of Books. Um, she's the author of The Culture of the High Renaissance, Ancients and Moderns in 16th Century Rome, The Scarif of Scornello, A Tale of Renaissance Forgery that centers on Volterra, From Heaven to Arcadia, Giordano Bruno, philosopher heretic. From Pompeii, the afterlife of a Roman town. Villa Taverna, and the collector of lives, Giorgio Vasari, and the invention of art history, I suppose, or art. <laughs> um, Co-written with Noah Charney. In 2009, she was awarded the Society for Italian Historical Studies Howard R. Marara Prize for Giordano Bruno. Roland has, been, uh, has published translations of Vitruvius' 10 books on architecture, which is my first interaction with Ingrid when I was at the academy and she was working on the translation. For some reason that I will never understand, she actually asked my opinion of her translation. I had essentially <laughs> nothing to contribute, but I was deeply flattered. Um, and, and Giordano Bruno's Italian dialogue on the heroic frenzies, an edition of the correspondence of Agostino Chigi, and the exhibition catalog, The Ecstatic Journey, Athanasius Kircher in Baroque Rome. Her last book is The Div Divine Spark of Syracuse. Um, that is actually the short version of <laughs> Ingrid's bio, um, but I hope it gives you a sense of her scope and range of interest and abilities, and it is my great pleasure to turn over the conversation to Ingrid. Thank you, David. <laughs> One of my great pleasures has been learning how to draw and paint with David in the past several years. And so you'll see 
a certain amount of leakage from art to scholarship. It really does go both ways, and it's so much fun to be here with him. This is now that great PowerPoint moment when we see whether technology is going to be our friend. Apparently so. And it looks all right. So this is really a presentation designed to begin conversations. And so I'm trying to aim it somewhat at a middle ground between practicing artists and scholars, senior people, junior people, and all of that. So I think what I mean is that it will be high on pictures <laughs> and a little bit light, L-I-T-E, on heavy-duty scholarship. Before we begin, I'd also like to point out that this is slightly after the anniversary of Raphael's death, but 501 years ago tonight, Agostino Chigi, his great patron, left this world. Marine Sanudo said it was a much more minor loss to the city of Rome, but I think in many ways, Raphael's career and the whole way that we think about art, institutionalizing art and all of that owes a good deal to the financial security offered by Kiji's sweeping vision of what finance should be. And what we're looking at here is a painting by Giorgio Vasari trying to be Raphael to a certain extent with a little bit of Michelangelo thrown in. And so here are the two people. Raphael, of course, was cut short in his 37th year. Vasari lived quite a bit longer. He died when he was well into, I guess he just hit his 60s. But you can see a very handsome man and a very short little man with eczema who is rather sensitive about his appearance and really about his talent, as we'll see. One of the things before we talk about Vasari is that we have to know the importance in his entire life of the concept of disegno, which means drawing, planning. A disegno is something that Machiavelli has people cooking up. It means draftsmanship. It means design, so it's one of those untranslatable words like ingenio, which means wit, invention, talent, all of this. And what we see here is Vasari's painting of St. Luke, painting the Madonna in an act of disegno. And on the side, I have two panels from his great libri di disegni, his great drawing collections. He's the first person really to make drawing into an object of collection. So that whatever we think about his painting, which even when you love him as I do, it's not as good as Raphael and he knew it, but he's an incredibly important figure and he's a highly intelligent man. Furthermore, he always finished the job on time. And I think that's one of his reasons for success. His homage to Raphael is paid in two ways. One is the biography of Raphael that you see in Vasari's famous Lives, published in 1550, and then again in this deluxe edition, much revised in 1568, in which he says one of his chief informants about Raphael is Raphael's pupil, Giulio Romano, who has issues with Raphael. Raphael was always that object that you can't quite get to. Giulio is the kind of person who's terribly ambitious, but he also had a rebellious streak. We can see it in his architecture, in his painting, and also in the kinds of stories he chooses to tell Vasari about Raphael, and that will come up at the end of this presentation. Basically, he also shaped the form of Italian painting in the 16th century. And here you can see how Vasari tries to make a middle ground between Michelangelo, you can see him with the Last Judgment in the Sistine Chapel ceiling on the left, and Raphael, especially late Raphael, where you can see the Madonna della Perla on the right, and then down below, 
the dog and cat from one of the Sistine Chapel tapestries because you could see that there's a very nice dog portrait in this Rimini adoration of the Magi that Vasari's done. And so he's taking the monumentality and the wild colors from Michelangelo. And especially as he says over and over and over throughout his lives of the artist, disegno, the uncompromising devotion to drawing that Michelangelo had. And he tries to add to that the sweetness of color, as he calls it, of Raphael with results that are hardworking and vastly influential because what he's doing is valorizing these two traditions that are going into what he sees as a kind of definitive synthesis enshrined not only in his own work, but also in the Florentine Accademia del Disegno, which is constituted in 1563. So right before the second edition of the Lives comes out and describes its curriculum. As you can see, it's really the opposite of what the pre-Raphaelite Brotherhood and before that the Nazarenes were loving about Umbrian painting. Vasari thinks that the Umbrian tradition in which Raphael was trained is literally diseased. And he talks about Raphael detoxing himself from his first master, Pietro Perugino. So here you have from the end of the biography of Raphael, Vasari goes into a whole disquisition about Raphael's different styles. And that's what I thought I'd linger on today in the time allotted to me. So this is part of 31 pages of biography. It's dense, action-packed, but Vasari, right before the end, goes through a synopsis of Raphael's different styles and starts out, as you can see, with Perugino, whose self-portrait you see here. <laughs> so he says he greatly improved on it. This is Raphael in full Peruginesque mode from Predella. That's in the Vatican now. You can see he can't even really do an Ionic or a Corinthian column, nor does he see a reason to. The perspective isn't quite right. He's getting somewhere, but we aren't ever going to know from that painting how far he would take it. This is the moment with Raphael's Marriage of the Virgin that Vasari in his biography marks the place. This is where Raphael takes off from his master and greatly improves on his master. And you can see here the comparison to what Raphael is doing that Vasari thinks is better. You can see the perspective is much more upfront. The architecture of the Temple of Jerusalem is much more complicated. The figures are more stately. It's a lot like Perugino, but there is still something different. Even the sway, say, in the priest who's joining the hands of Mary and Joseph, all of this indicates somebody who's striking out on a new path. The next event, as far as Vasari is concerned in the stylistic life of Raphael, is Leonardo. And I have him here not in that usual portrait of an old man that's taken as an image of Leonardo, but Leonardo's famous Vitruvian man, who I think really is a self-portrait of Leonardo, probably in the altogether, and certainly as a figure who's central. He's man, and I use the term advisedly, not as humankind, but as Y chromosome man, as the center of his own universe. <laughs> Unlike Vitruvius, but that's another story. So you can see what Raphael, according to Vasari is getting from Leonardo is disegno and getting grace, grazia. And what's really fascinating here is the fact that Raphael understands a superior kind of artistry when he sees it, drops Perugino and goes after Leonardo. This is even more telling in, see, we've got the hard challenges 
that Raphael knew in certain ways he could never surpass Leonardo, but he tried. And what you can see is that Vasari is using this word fundamento terribile. It's that terribilita that he ascribes to Michelangelo. And one of the places that he believes you can see this change in Raphael himself is the deposition or the descent from the cross that is now in the Borghese Gallery in Rome. Vasari's entire idea of the history of art revolves around his own idol and mentor Michelangelo. And so here is where Raphael finally gets into contact with the ultimate of artists in Vasari's book and does so with the drawings that Michelangelo did at the Battle of Kashina that was going to be put up on the walls of Palazzo Vecchio in Florence. And then this wonderful passage is that anybody else would have lost heart realizing that he'd been throwing away his time up to then. They would never have done what Raphael did. And then he uses this wonderful word, <laughs> zmorbato. <laughs> zmorbato si è lavato si dadoso. Taking a burden off your back and getting cured of your disease. It's undiseasing yourself of the tradition of Umbrian painting. And so what you get is the Raphael that we begin to see in Rome. Even though the crucial moment, according to Vasari, in Raphael's life happens in Florence, which is probably where he's looking at Leonardo as well in the Battle of Anghiari, where you see the manifestation of this lesson absorbed is when Raphael gets to Rome and begins to work for Pope Julius II, as in the School of Athens seen here. The work of art that Raphael does that really for Vasari pinpoints the moment where he's understood what Michelangelo has to offer is the Chigi Chapel done for Agostino Chigi in the Church of Santa Maria della Pace. This is the less studied and less considered of the two Kiji chapels for a couple of reasons. One of them is that until recently, the upper part of this wasn't restored. Neither part was restored when I first came to Rome as a student, and everything was under a kind of pall. What you can see now in the brilliant colors, this is painted right after the 1510 sneak preview that Donato Bramante gave Raphael of what Michelangelo was done, doing in the Sistine Chapel. And so what you're seeing here is not just the Battle of Kashina. This is the colors of the Sistine Chapel, the Sibyls of the Sistine Chapel, the prophets of the Sistine Chapel, and Agostino Chigi, who's become at this point one of the two richest men in Europe in face-to-face -face competition and alliance with the great German banker, Jakob Fugger, the rich. Agostino, the magnificent, painted or commissioned this chapel. And it's really offering Raphael's answer to what Michelangelo is doing, sweetening it. You can see he's doing all kinds of nice experiments with conjante fabric, changing color here as Michelangelo's doing on the Sistine Chapel and emphasizing knees, which David assures me is one of the touchstones of excellence as a painter. And Raphael sees this magnificent knee that Michelangelo's done in the end of the Sistine Chapel and said, you want a knee, I can do you a knee. And the best knee of all is this Isaiah from the Church of San Agostino in Rome which is amazing for a lot of reasons. It's got Greek, Latin, and Hebrew inscriptions. And this is recognizably a Jewish man. It's probably, in fact, a specific rabbi who was studying with the great Augustinian theologian, Giles of Viterbo. Vasari also greatly admires Raphael's liberation of St. Peter because of this beautiful night scene. And it's something he tries to do himself. He loves the Madonna dell'Impanata because he feels here really Raphael has reached a synthesis between good disegno 
good anatomy and sweetness in colors. And one of the striking things about Vasari's analyses of paintings is the way that he believes that all these poses, attributes, and figures reveal character and relationships. And so he's an uh, education in itself about how to read Renaissance painting. We may not agree with him, but he's unbelievably informative and he gives you an example of absolute engagement with every aspect of painting. And Vasari himself is a learned person. He was classically educated, but he's also an educated craftsman and he's got a phenomenal work ethic. And one of the things he admires of Raphael is the work ethic. One of his favorite paintings is this vision of Ezekiel for the same reason that I love it. In my case, it's because it was hung at a show at the Prado at eye level, and for the first time, it's usually in the Pity Palace on a wall with a bunch of other things. But suddenly, when you're eye to eye with this painting, you can see that in the space of about one inch, there's this incredible landscape that goes back to infinity. And the fact that Raphael can pack all of that into a little tiny strip tells you what a great, and as Vasari says, a minute painter. He takes the minute quality of Perugino's Umbrian style and translates it into this much more monumental Roman style that's evolving through Raphael and Michelangelo, working as rivals and as colleagues together and then culminating in Raphael's Transfiguration, the last painting that he did. And this is where Vasari said why he wanted to talk about all these styles. He wants to show with what effort, energy, and diligence this honorable craftsman unfailingly disciplined himself. And then he's finally, this where he says, he'd add that each of us must be condemned with doing what he feels inclined to do by natural instinct and not put his hand to competing in what he has not been granted by nature. That's Vasari acknowledging his own limitations <laughs> charmingly. He pays tribute to Raphael in a number of ways. And so I'll just show you specifically he has a close relationship with Bindo Altoviti, who was a gloriously handsome young man, Raphael or Giulio Romano more likely, painted him around 1512. And you can see he was a plotter against the Medici. And so when Girolamo da Carpi portrays him, what you've got is a man who's a real man of the world. And those bee stung lips are still there. He never had a lot of hair. He's got a hat to disguise the male pattern baldness. In later life, he had a dreadful hairnet, which every man of fashion, the Fuggers started it, I think. And you can see Bindo's no longer dressed in his handsomeness. He's dressed in fur and silk and everything he can get his hands on. But he is the Agostino Kiji of his own day. And so Vasari's painting for Bindo is really trying again to have Michelangelo's musculature and Raphael's color he tried in Palazzo Altoviti, demolished to make the Tiber embankment, to recreate Agostino Chigi's loggia for Bindo. And so you've got echoes here of the so-called Villa Farnesina. As I said, the liberation of St. Peter inspired this fantastic night scene in the Salone dei Cinquecento in Palazzo Vecchio. This is the conquest of Siena with more lanterns than you could shake his stick at. He loves the expulsion of Heliodorus. He doesn't think much of the nudes and fire in the Borgo, but he borrows from both for this painting for Pope Gregory the 13th of Gregory the 9th coming back to Rome. And then finally, I thought I'd just say a word about that legend of Raphael's death, supposedly because he'd been putting or tying one on the night before. This is a 1943 movie in, called La Fornarina, dedicated to Raphael and his love for the trust David A. Baker's daughter. 
the actress who's playing the foreign artist, you know, was a former mistress of Joseph Goebbels. This is 1943 in Rome. You can imagine the political orientations of this. But note that Raphael also painted a lot of professional women. I think that this Fornarina legend, first of all, it's written, it's a compendium in the early 19th century of wishful thinking and blown up biographical information from Vasari, who says nothing about Baker's daughters or Trastevere, really. All he says is that Agostino locked Raphael into a room where he was painting a commission. The room has two, three, four, five, six, seven doors. And so I don't believe that. I don't believe that this is by Raphael. This is going to upset some people. But look at that lower hand. Would Raphael paint that? I think not. I think this is John Francesco Penny painting Beatrice Ferrarese or one of the professional women. And that hand gesture of the split fingers tells you right up front what this woman's profession is. As for his premature death, it could have been malaria. I'd also point out that the transfiguration is a veritable triumph of arsenic-laced paint called orpiment, and there you have it. So the Vasari gives us a lot to think about and a lot to embroider on, but I'd focus and trust him more on things about style. Thank you. Thank you, Ingrid. Well, that's a fantastic introduction to our, our, our series of lectures because in many ways, the idea of how Raphael's interpreted later depends so much on those first interpretations and those first stories, the stories that kept passed along through artist studios that get sort of codified by Vasari. Um, but it's as much the, the idea of Raphael and the myth of Raphael that sustains the interest in Raphael over the centuries as, as his, the work itself. Um, now it's my, my pleasure to introduce Olivier Bonfait. I discovered Professor Bonfait in his role in the Comitato Scientifico of the recent Academia di San Luca conference, Raffaello nelle Accademie d'Arte, Modello Funzione Ricezione, like ours originally scheduled for 2020. He's professor in the history of modern art at the Université de Bourgogne in the Department of the Social Sciences. After a thesis on painting and society in Bologna, Professor Bonfait became a lecturer at the Sorbonne, then responsible for the history of art at the Académie de France and scientific advisor at the INHA, the Institut National d'Histoire de l'Art. After having been a professor at the University of Aix-Marseille, he joined the Laboratoire uh, interdisciplinaire de recherche, uh, Société Sensibilité Soin, in 2011. He has curated numerous exhibitions and founded the reviews Studiolo and Perspective. He also teaches at the Ecole de Louvre. His work focuses on the history of the arts in France and Italy in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, and on the artistic literature of the period from a visual, cultural, and social history perspective. Among his publications are the books Poussin and Louis XIV, Après Caravage, and Les Tableaux, Tableaux et Les Penseaux. So I give you Professor Olivier Bonfait. Thanks a lot for this presentation and uh, for this um, for inviting me to participate to this beautiful conference. I hope you see now my PowerPoint. Uh, which is just a little for me. Okay, but it's not the first one. Do like that. So, as we are not unfortunately in Rome, I decided to change a little bit my um, the point of view of my lecture. Uh, I will of course, speak about Raphael and French art from 1640 to 1789 to the revolution, but it will be with a point of view from, from Rome. Um, and I will explain this changement in a few minutes. Of course, the, the story 
of the many links between Raphael and French art is not new. It's beginning the, already in the 17th century with writers as Felidien, and it was studied recently in books by Martin Rosenberg, in exhibition at the Grand Palais, or in some recent papers as Stéphane was about the copies at the French Academy in Rome. This story is generally the idea that Raphael was very important for French art and it was considered as a god of painting. It's a story which was incarnated by Ang's paintings, but also by Ang's teaching or discourses. And we can see here the name of Raphael under this big statue of the small painter Ang. I am wondering if this influence of Raphael on French painting is not a little uh, too much important, as considered as too much important. There are many paintings where scholars have seen the influence of Raphael, as in this Restout Presentations of the Virgin, where, in fact, I think the influence of Dominicino perhaps also of Pietro da Cortona, is more important than the influence of Raphael. So it will be useful to change the point of view, to go outside Paris and to go in Rome to nuance this assertion of the considerable influence on Raphael and French art. For doing so, I will focus my analysis outside France, in Rome, but with French artists. This internal and external point of view has the advantage of putting forward different elements of Raphael receptions. The media, prints, paintings, drawings, copy and original paintings, different issues, Artistical, of course, but also political and cultural. And to reintroduce the artist in this history. What is the demand for Raphael from France in Rome? And how the artist can reply to this demand? Or sometimes he elaborates this demand. Indeed, at the beginning of the 17th century, Raphael is not so much important for French artists. Martin Fréminet, a painter active from 1580 to 1616, has made a trip in Rome. He has grown after Michelangelo. And when he comes back in France, when he came back in France for doing the decoration of the vault of the Trinity Chapel, at the Palace of Fontainebleau for the king. There is, of course, an influence of Michelangelo, but we can't see any influence of Raphael in this, first, in this painting. The first change is not around 1626 with the arrival of Voué in Paris, a date which is considered generally as the beginning of the French school, but later in the 1640s, we have the introduction of new images from Raphael in France. First of all, by engravers like Francois Perrier, who was famous, who have reproduced famous antiquities from Rome, and who in 1640 decided to engrave the Loggia of Psyche in Rome and to send. As this prince in France. So, a painter as Michel Corneille, when he's realizing, when he realized his Rome trip in 1650, not only grew after Raphael, but also engraved a new 
image of Raphael, the massacre of the, of the innocents from the Scola Nova, which have never been printed, reproduced by prints before. And so there was, for the French artist, a new possibility to see movement, expression of emotion, drama for the French painting in Paris. Fréard de Chanteloup, who was at the same time the patron and the supervisor, more or less, of Poussin, decided when Poussin came back in, in Rome in 1642 to ask him to supervising copies from paintings made after new painting, after paintings by Raphael. It was new painting for French scholars, for French artists. The portraits of the Pope, the Holy Family, which was at the time considered as by Raphael, painting which has never been engraved and which was not known, not known in France in a, for French artists. When the French painter who lived most of all in Rome, Nicolas Poussin, came to Paris from 1640 to 1642, he has to realize a huge altar paintings for a, monument, for a very important church, the Noviciate of the Jesuits. He decided to paint the miracle of Saint Francis Xavier and in this composition, in this composition, of course, he tried to show how Raphael is important for him. By the B partition in two parts of the composition, by the frontality of the Christ, and by also all the wandering of the emotions. But this painting was a failure. It was not in accordance with the mood in Paris for a painting smoother, more fluent, as realized Simon Vouet for the same church of the Jesuit Novitiates in 1642. Anyway, for the same patrons, Sublet de Noyer, who ordered the novitiate of the Jesuits, Gilles Rousselet decided to translate in a new engraving a painting by Raphael, a Raphael paintings, the, Bal the Belle Jardinière, which was a little forgotten in the Palace of Fontainebleau. And his engraving is classicism. Raphael, made, made in, is rendering Raphael more legible, more appropriating for French artists. He insists on the drawings, on the contour, on the harmony between the pyramidal composition and the landscapes, which is behind, so to give a new model for the French artist. And this effort has some success. In 1662, Frère de Chambray, the brother of Frère de Chanteloup, the patron of Poussin, uh, an officier of Sudé Noyer, who has decided the construction of the Genesiette, wrote an important book, the, flat, the first French book on painting, Idée de la perfection de la peinture. The painting has to be perfect as his French. And in this details about the perfection of painting, of course, all the examples are coming from Raphael. The judgment of Paris, the massacre of the innocents, the descent of the cross. It is a complete changement against the art of the beginning of the 16th century in front of the board of the, of the chapel of the Palace of the King at Fontainebleau in 1610-1620, only 30 years before. Now, Michelange is not a good example, but it is Raphael, which is the example to follow. So, in 1660, Raphael has become, for the first time in France, 
a paradigm of painting. But it is difficult for the 13th, for Louis XIV, who decide to recreate the French Academy of Painting in 1663, who decide to demanticate Rome and to put up Paris as the capital of the arts, who depends on the Italian painters. So Raphael will be considered as the father of painting, but he has to be killed to give the possibility to elaborate monuments for Nicolas Poussin and for Lebrun. And that we see in the drawing, in, Poussin, in Lebrun's drawings, and the title given by the Louvre to the Lebrun's, to Lebrun's drawing. Lebrun has literally spoiled Raphael. He has taken, of course, his inspiration from Raphael. But he gives a fiction that he has invented himself this position of a naked body suspended in the air. He has stripped off the Saint Michel of Raphael and has realized a French model for French artists. So Raphael now even became a tool for the French monarchy to take possession of painting, of Raphael, and of Rome. And now we have to go back to Rome in the decennies 1680, 1690, where the French, when the French Academy in Rome, created in 1666, is, is um, functions perfectly. And we can see in these years how Raphael is an object of desire for replicating tapestry. Raphael is the incarnation of French styles against the degenerate Italians. And Raphael is a tool to take possession of Rome. The first scope of the creation of the French Academy in Rome is not to give a place for artists to sting Raphael. It's a given place for artists to take possession by duplicating them of big examples of the art of the past, antiquities, sculpture, paintings of the 16th century, and Raphael. And so the task of the young painters is to do a copy, the more secure possible, at the scale one to one from the after the paintings, after the fresco of Raphael, for raising, raising in Paris, at the Gobelin, tapestries for the palace of the king. It's the first scope of the French Academy in Rome, but it will be also an encouragement of taking possession of Raphael and on transforming fresco, sculptures, paintings in new media as a colored engraving from the, for the king or for the collection in Paris at the end of the 17th century. And there will be also for the decoration of the palaces of the king, a new interest for Raphael about the grotesque which will be refused in their globality with a very strong interest for the decoration for the ornamental for new covenants by Francois d'Aguestier at the end of the 17th century. There will be also the proof of the French virtuosity in replicating Raphael, realizing two sheet prints of massive dimension, more than one meter in height, doing so a new Raphael for French. Above all, the French will consider themselves as the true heirs of Raphael. Pietro di Cortona have spread libertinism, and it's now the French artists with, who are 
the true heirs, the painters who act as new Raphael in Rome and in Paris. And it's to the young artists have to go after Raphael to empower the beautiful, the accuracy of contour, beautiful proportions, and to transmute Raphael in French art at the, uh, and in Paris. Raphael was also a tool to conquer Rome, to manifest the presence of the French king in the materiality of Rome, in the place of Rome. The palace of the Pope, the Vatican Palace, is busy with a big scaffolding used by the French artists to doing the copies after Raphael for 20, 30 years in the earth of Rome. And also, to do copies after the fresco of Raphael is a way of teaching to the Roman and the Italian, to the church, the true story of the church. It's the king, it's the French king who have given territories to the Pope, and so, of course, to the Pope. And so, of course, the Pope has to be grateful to Louis XIV. At the beginning of the 18th century, during the years 1710s, this is 1710s, 1720, there will be a lack of interest for Raphael. And we can find a new interest for Raphael in the after, between 1730 and 1775, 1750, 1755, more or less. But now it's more just the utilization of Raphael. Raphael will be just a source for raising cartoons again for the monarchy. And so the copyists have to be the more fidels, the more scrupulous in doing the copies to replace exactly the composition of uh, Raphael. As we can see also by this painting uh, by, made by Louis Blanchet. <laughs> and you can see also that this painting are not really, really considered as the Louvre and they are just in the storage and they need a big restoration. For doing again, tapestry to ornate uh, the palace of the king with the fifteenth in this time. But there is already some criticism about this practice and about the idea that Raphael is the god of the painting. We can see that in the letter of President de Brosse, an Esprit des Lumières in 1739, where he will prove to the young artists that they are boring themselves doing copies, and above all, that Raphael is not so much great for the colorist, and it's not perhaps the examples to copy uh, for, the, for the king. If we take another point of view, not from the monarchy, but from the artists themselves, we'll see that there is this interest for Raphael, but, but as a way to appropriate for themselves Raphael, to take possession in their own way of Raphael, not to venerate the big painter of the 16th century, but to transmute Raphael as a tool for themselves. It's what we can see with 60 drawings realized by Bouchardon between 1727 and 1730, which are now more in the, in the Louvre. And we can see that Bouchardon is not doing a copy of all the composition of Raphael. He's doing just a copy of the heads at scale one to one, going part to the rendering of the emotion, of the expression of, of patience. And when he's doing a copy after a group of Raphael, of Raphael, he's transmuting a fresco in two dimensions into a statue group in three dimensions. What is the situation at the end of the 18th century? We could have 
hope that with the beginning of the neoclassicism, there will be a new interest for Raphael. But it's not really the case, as we can see in the number of quotations of Raphael in all the letters sent by the directors of the French Academy to the Minister of the Art in Paris. There are so many quotations of Raphael at the end of the 17th century, more than 40 in five, in five years between 1699 and 1699. At the beginning of the 18th century, a small number, again, a relatively great number, between 1630 and 1650. And as you can see, at the end of the 18th century, Raphael is not so much important. For five years, between 1774 and 1779, Raphael was never quoted by the director of the French Academy, he was not in the mind of the director of the French Academy. In fact, Raphael is not at this time the only god of the painting for the artist. He is now inside of a group of artists, Michelangelo, Domenichino, and also Poussin, who will have a portrait of him between Caracci and Raphael in the Pantheon, thanks to the French at the end of the 18th century. You have still even the possibility to forget completely Raphael. When Elisabeth Vigée Lebrun, leaving Paris in the revolution in 1789, is going to Rome in the Vatican Palace in front of Raphael Fresco, she is remembering a sentence, an assertion of a former director of the French Academy. Why do you need to copy contours of Raphael figure? To take a new model, the new model will be the nature, the nature, and go to the Piazza del Popolo, and so you can forget Raphael. Thanks. Thank you, Olivier. That was um, dense with, uh, for me, new information, a new perspective. The thing I, I'd like to suggest that we can maybe continue to talk about is apropos this idea that um, Raphael is an international pan-European phenomenon. How he's received in each country is very much conditioned by the nature of that country, what their issues, agendas are, um, who mediates that, that uh, information like the artist Poussin or the directors of the Academy. Um, there, there's so much about the cultural identity of the context within which Raphael is appreciated that conditions how Raphael is appreciated and what of what he did was appreciated. And, and I mean, not just in terms of um, his... Um, so now, now we're going to hear from Professor Adriano Aimonino. Adriano Aimonino has um, curated several exhibitions including Paper Palaces, the Topham Collection as a Source for British Neoclassicism in 2013, and Drawn from the Antique, Artist and the Classical Ideal, held at the Sir John Soane's Museum in London in 2015, which is actually how I discovered him through the excellent catalog, uh, which is handy by my desk in my studio at all times. Professor Imanino is Senior Lecturer and Director of Undergraduate Programs in the Department of the History of Art at the University of Buckingham in England. He graduated in history of art from the University of Rome, where he was born, and then attained a master's degree at the Warburg Institute in London, and after which he completed his PhD at the University of Venice. His main interest is the reception of the classical tradition in the early modern period, 
with a particular focus on 18th century Britain. Prior to joining the University of Buckingham in 2012, he held a postdoctoral fellowship at the Powell Mellon Center for uh, Studies in British Art at Yale University um, and, um, and at the Getty Research Institute in Los Angeles. In 2009 and 10, he worked as head of research for the Commission for Looted Art in Europe, based in London. That must have given him an interesting perspective. He's currently working on a book on the architectural language of Robert Adam, which will be published by Yale University Press on a critical edition of Robert Adam's correspondence and with Nicholas Penny and Eloisa Dodero on a revised edition of Francis Haskell and Nicholas P uh, Penny's fundamental text, Taste in the Antique. So I give you Adriano Aimonino. Thank you very much, David. Let me see if I can. Can you hear me? I assume you can. Perfect. So um, thank you, David, for this introduction. Thank you for inviting me. And I will, my, my lecture is what we just heard from Olivier. So what uh, I will discuss today is really yet another chapter of the wide pan-European reception of Raphael in the 17th and 18th century. But the, and particularly focused on England, uh, uh, where this reception is not so well known outside English uh, uh, scholarship, I would say. And the English case is, is extremely interesting and crucial in the history of this reception because it's, it's, uh, it's an ideal lens and it's a great case study to investigate how the normative role of Raphael was uh, uh, used to shape from scratch, literally from scratch, a new artistic tradition and a new modern system of the arts. So how Raphael was used in order to structure academic practices and how to support a new national history of art, a new national theory of art, which didn't exist before anyway. So today I will really talk about uh, uh, academic practices and the theory that was developed in order to support these academic practices, especially in the first half of the 18th century before the foundation of the Royal Academy in 1768, one of the last European academies to be established in, uh, in the 18th century, which is quite meaningful in itself. And the English case, uh, and I'm talking about English because I will focus on London rather than on any other of the uh, uh, British uh, 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 cities. The English case is also extremely important because um, it shows what happens when you apply a rigid normative system of principles with universal claims, although we all know very well that it was mainly developed in Florence and in the 17th century in Rome and in Paris. So a strict normative set of principle was adapted to a completely different context, exactly what David was referring to five minutes ago, a completely different political, social and cultural context of England in the 18th century, a more modern context with all the friction that this will cause, because you will see that the path that will lead to the foundation of the Royal Academy with Raphael at the center is dotted with hurdles, uh, 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 oppositions, resistance, etc., 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 which are very revealing of a more urban, commercial, and bourgeois uh, uh, structure of the British society compared to the continent, at least from the 1720s onwards. So I will start my lecture and I will show you only this quote, I promise, uh, with a quote from uh, Jean André Roquet a theorist who actually was in Britain in the 1750s and published his present states of the art in England, then uh, in French, but then translated immediately in English. And he says, and here I may observe, notwithstanding all that has been given out to the country, and remember that we are in 1755, so as late as 1755, that the arts are not made an object of the public attention in England, for there is no foundation or institution in their favor, neither by the government in general, nor in particular by the crown. And although this is, of course, the opinion of a Frenchman on the English in the 18th century, so we should take it with a grain of salt and vice versa, it corresponds mostly to truth. We need to remember the peculiarity of the English case. 
Once, at the beginning of the 18th century, there was basically no system for the arts. There was no national school of painting. There was no art market uh, because of several factors, especially a certain uh, a suspicion on, on the part of the Protestant middle class towards Catholic and pagan imagery. And it's only really after the glorious revolution of 1688, which establishes a constitutional monarchy, that a new ruling class, the Whig ruling class, I'm simplifying here, the Whig ruling class uh, who identifies completely with the senatorial class of the age of Augustus, where there was a balance between Senate and ruler as in the constitutional monarchy of England, it's only with this new Augustan ruling class that classicism, the cult of the old, old masters, and the embracement of an academic system of the arts imported from the continent really takes shape. So at the beginning of the 18th century, when my, uh, when my story starts, uh, if you were a young budding artist trying to actually get the rudiments in drawings, in design, in composition, in color, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, you were in a very difficult position. You had almost no place to go. There were some academies tried to uh, that had been established at the end of the 17th century, but with no result. There was one notable exception, though: the Crown owned the Raphael cartoons. And I will cut a very long story short here. The great Raphael cartoons, you're looking at the Raphael court at the VNA, which fortunately has been completely refurbished and will open in a couple of months and hopefully will attract more visitors. You see, these, these are queuing for a different exhibition. No one stops in the Raphael court now, but I'm sure that this will change soon. The Raphael cartoons actually produced by Raphael between 1515 and 17 for Leo Defend as the basis, the preparatory drawings for the great tapestries of the Sixteen Chapel, were then acquired by the English crown by Charles I, the future Charles I in 1623, and remained in the British royal collection throughout the trouble uh, uh, events of the 17th century. They remained in the royal collection even after the Commonwealth and the Commonwealth sales. But until the arrival of William III of Orange after the glorious revolution of 1688, uh, until 1697, the cartoons actually were cut into stripes and kept in storage at the, uh, uh, at, the uh, at Hampton Court. It's only in 1797 that William III decides actually to take them, take them out of storage, restore them, and he commissioned Sir William Wren uh, to, Sir Christopher Wren, sorry, to build a classical gallery in Hampton Court where the cartoons first, for the first time in the history in Britain can be displayed and can be seen by the public at large, a selected public of courtiers and invited guests, but nonetheless, they're visible. And this is the beginning of the immense weight that the Raphael cartoons will have in the structuring of a modern system of the arts in Britain for nationalistic reasons, but also because they were there. They were at easy reach, actually. So they are exposed for the first time in 1697. And this is a very crucial date because in 1697, William III tries to establish a royal academy for the first time. This is this uh, uh, with, the, with the cartoons at its center, but this fails. But nonetheless, the story of the reception of the cartoons starts. Uh, Simon Griblin produces the first set of engraving in 1707 and then reissued many times. This is the frontispiece that you're looking at, but then crucially, and I can touch only on some of the reproduction of the cartoons, crucially, Nicolas Dorigny, we have already seen a print, an engraving by Dorigny in Olivier's presentation. Nicolas Dorigny, the most important producer of uh, uh, reproductive engravings in the early 18th century after the death of Gerard Dodran in 1703. Nicolas Dorigny is summoned from Rome, whether he had already published Raphael and the Antique widely. He is the great product of the French and Italian academic system at the beginning of the 18th century in a way. He is summoned to England exactly in order to produce and disseminate in a Roman manner the cartoons of Raphael. He arrives in 1711 and this is a crucial turning point 
in for the arts in Britain. Why? Because in 1711, he starts producing this set of engravings with an army of French engravers who had come with him to London in order to complete this enterprise. The enterprise would be finished in 1719, but also in 1711, the great Queen Street Academy, the most important of the early art academies uh, of Britain in the 18th century is established and Dorigny is made one of its first director. So in this period, you have three things mainly. First, the diffusion of the Raphael cartoons on a national level because Dorigny engravings then will be reprinted innumerable, innumerable times and uh, throughout the 18th century, the number of different reproductions in engraving, in etching, in mezzotint, in chiaroscuro of the Raphael cartoons is really overwhelming. And I can only show you this example. So a national awareness uh, and the beginning of a construction of, the, on, of a discourse on art uh, is really based uh, from 1711 onwards on the cartoons by Raphael at Hampton Court. Second, with the arrival of Dorigny and his uh, pupils, uh, the establishment of a national school of engraving in a way, because they train the local school and many of these pupils will reproduce the Raphael cartoons. So it's exponential in that sense. And third, Dorigny being one of the directors of the great uh, Queen Street Academy, he will start using the prints, his drawings from the Raphael cartoons, hands, feet, eyes, heads, etc., etc., as teaching tools within the academy. So you have, in a way, the creation of a uh, centrality of uh, uh, the uh, Raphael cartoons for pedagogical. Uh, uh, principles within the artistic training in England. In the same period, and I will not bore you with the uh, innumerable different academies that will be established in Britain in the first half of the 18th century, very, very often fighting against each other with secessions, with uh, competitions, etc., etc. But nonetheless, in the 20s and 30s, other academies sprang up in competition with the great Queen Street Academy and different material derived from the Raphael cartoons is produced. First, for instance, the series of 19 heads derived from the drawings by Dorigny, which clearly are used in a pedagogical way. This is a study of expression. So instead of using Lebrun, the English actually use much more these uh, uh, elements from the Raphael cartoons. And also the other great episode that should be mentioned very interesting from a cultural point of view rather than the aesthetic results, if I may say so, are uh, the large scale, life size copies of the cartoons produced by the most important late Baroque artist of England, Sir James Thornhill, the King's artist, who between 1729 and 1731 will produce three different sets of copies oil on canvas, among which this life size series is now at the Royal Academy because it was bequeathed in 1800. But Thornhill himself had an academy at his house in Covent Garden and clearly used these copies and also more than 250 tracing and details that he drew from Raphael cartoons in order to teach uh, a, a composition, proportion, design, chiaroscuro, and especially expression to a new generation of British artists. So really, let's say in the first 40 years of this difficult path of formation of a new art world, Raphael cartoons among other resources, but certainly Raphael cartoons hold a central founding position in this emerging new art world and art school. So how was this supported by theory? And I will, be, I will quote only one example. The first one is an essay of material painting by George Richardson. The second one is an account of some of the statues by relief drawings and pictures in Italy by George Richardson and his son. These two are extremely important for the history of British art because the first one is the first attempt to give a theoretical framework to the visual art ever produced in Britain. And the second one is the most important guidebook for anyone traveling on their grand tour in Italy throughout the 18th century. Both books were printed thousands of times. This is an exaggeration, but many times during the 18th century. And in both 
both the theoretical uh, treatise and the practical guidebook, Raphael held, holds a central position. In an essay, he is the champion of inventio, of compositio, of the study of the human passion, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Very much based on French art theory, in a way, Frère de Chambre, we just heard, but also Philippe Bien, De Peel, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. The second one, uh, in the central part of the account, you have a huge section devoted to the Vatican Stanze, where Raphael is the champion, is the new appellus, uh, tropes that goes back to the 16th century, and, and to Bellori, of course, and uh, is uh, uh, it's really basically the champion that anyone should imitate. But Richardson goes as far as saying that the Raphael cartoons at Ampton Court are even better than the Vatican Stanze provoking the, of course, rage of the girls, the French and the Italians in Rome. And he calls the great school of Raphael at Hampton Court. So in a way, also the theory, and I'm just showing you the two uh, most important product of the theory is there to support, in a way, the formation of an academic uh, system of the art based on Roman and French examples. However, and here I, uh, I touch upon the battle that I mentioned in my title. In the 1740s, um, a new vision, a completely different conception of what art should be, and also what academic teaching should be, starts to emerge. And it's embodied by the figure, the polemic figure of William Hogarth. Hogarth actually despised the Italian and French Academy, the foolish parade of the director of the French Academy, he calls it, and instead promotes an academic training. He founds his own academy, the St. Martin's Lane Academy in 1735. He promotes a structure which is bottom up, where actually the students decide how to pose the live model. And he promotes the study of nature as it is. So the live model rather than an idealized form of nature. So Raphael, the antique and the old master, he is against the copy of the old masters and Raphael. Despite the fact that he treasures Raphael, he is the son-in-law of Thornhill and probably he inherited the drawings by Thornhill. But he's against an academic system which is hierarchical and treasures basically works of art produced, especially history painting produced in the 15th and 17th century because he advocates a new moral uh, type of painting, modern, the subject should be a modern moral painting for a completely new and different audience. So the audience, an audience that is urban, that is middle class, and then can buy a very commercially oriented attitude is the one by Ogre, can buy his new English painting rather than collecting the old masters that come from the continent. This image, I think is one of the most <laughs> wonderful images of the 18th century in terms of this battle between the old and the new in a sense and in this case that's why britain in the 18th century is so interesting because you see dynamics that then will explode in other countries or europe only in the 18th century and you have here this is the auction house of cock that's why the the cockerel on top who's selling to the british aristocracy copies and copies and copies and copies, and copies ditto 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 the infinite of Baroque Italian and French painting, Alla Guidorini, that's put it away, or Maratti. And here you have Hogarth's studio where his new moral, uh, 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 moral painting, for instance, the Mariage alla Mode is battling against the similar subjects from ancient painting and old masters. Here his Mariage alla Mode is battling against the Aldo Brandini wedding. So really the battle of the pictures, but this is, here is comical, of course, but it's really revealing of the tension that actually starts to arise in the middle, in the 1740s and 50s in Britain. However, exactly to counterbalance, and you will see that I will go back to Raphael in a second, to counterbalance, in a way, the new vision of Hogarth, uh, to counterbalance this uh, commercially driven and uh, uh, modern vision of the art, uh, a group of artists who had been to Rome, who had been on their grand tour, Reynolds, Wilson, Wilton, Ramsey, etc., etc., and a group of aristocrats, of grand tourists who had all been to Rome and were keen to support the uh, 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 full application 
of the classical ideal and the full application of an academic system based on the Italian and French model gathered together to found a new society, the Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacture and Commons. And you see that the three different definitions are typical of this obsession with improvement, which is typical of the British Enlightenment in all different settings. So the society actually started to structure against Hogarth, who in fact was terribly against them and even withdrew from the St. Martin Lane Academy in opposition to this new system that was established in the 1750s, organized in different institutions. And other attempts at founding a Royal Academy had failed again in the 40s and 50s. So the society decided to start from bottom up, imitating in many ways the system that was provided by the Academia di San Luca and the Capitoline Museum in the 1750s with all the different institutions. Young students were sent to drawing schools, school first, to learn geometry, perspective, proportions. Then they would have been sent, uh, previous recommendation, to learn uh, anatomy and the, living, and the live model at the second St. Martin Lane Academy, despite Hogger's opposition. Then they would have been sent, or at the same time, to the Duke of Richmond Gallery, where the third Duke of Richmond, you see an aristocratic patron, had put together the first great collection of plaster casts after antique statues visible in England. We are in 1758. So the students could actually uh, copy the idealized model and the real model at the same time. And eventually the best drawings were uh, 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 rewarded annually by premiums that the society actually um, uh, uh, organized from 17, 1754 onwards. So you see, this is very similar to the system of the Scuola del Nudo in Campidoglio, of the School of the Antique in the Campidoglio and the Academy Francese in Rome, of the Concorsi Clementini that were completely reorganized in the 1750s, etc., etc., etc. Where is Raphael in all this? Where would you go in 1750 to copy from the old masters? In Rome, you could go in many different places also in the Pinacoteca Capitolina, which was opened in 1748. In London, this was absolutely impossible in the middle of the 18th century because all the old masters that had been collected by the aristocracy, those Dito, Dito, Dito that we saw before in August print, had been tucked away in country houses, inaccessible to young students, and also in urban palaces of the aristocracy and the gentry that very often were not open for artists and for the public. So. In order to provide young students with, uh, uh, with good old masters in the academic Roman manner uh, to copy within the system put together by the Society of Artists, the first Duke of Northumberland, a member of the Society of Artists like the Duke of Richmond, opened a Northumberland house. This is basically in front of uh, the National Gallery. We're on the south side of Trafalgar Square, and this is the beginning of the strength Northumberland House was demolished in 1874, but all the institutions that I mentioned, the Duke of Richmond Gallery, Northumberland House, the Society of Artists, and Martin Lane's Academy, were all very close to each other around Northumberland House. And on the back of the house in 1757, so exactly in those years when the society is trying to um, organize the system for artistic education based on uh, uh, on Italian and French, but especially Roman standards. He opened this gigantic gallery ballroom and he displayed these life size copies uh, commissioned thanks to the help of Horace Mann in Florence and Cardinal Albani in Rome. He commissioned to Mengs, Batoni, uh, Agostino Masucci, and Placido Costanzi, he commissioned a school of Raphael. So you would have had, of course, the school of Athens in the middle, the Council of the God, and the Feast of the God by Raphael from the Farnesina, and then you would have had, of course, the Aurora by Guido Reni, and where we are, you would have seen the triumph of Bacchus and Arianes by Carrasci in the Galleria Farnese. So really, the school of Raphael in the Roman academic manner <clears throat> for the training of British artists, and we know that this gallery was open to artists on specific days of the month and the week, for <clears throat> the training of national taste, and the training of, uh, of young artists within the system of the Society of the Arts put together in the 1750s. 
Bear in mind that this is the largest and most expensive commission of copies throughout the 18th century in the whole of Europe. Just to give you an idea of the scale, Northumberland House was knocked down in 1874. The paintings were scattered. All these are now cut and displayed in Palazzo Labia in Venice, something that is not very well known. The School of Athens went later on to the VNA and today is displayed in the cast court of the VNA. These are the, the onlooker. Look at the size of this, of this, how big this gallery must have been. So you have a whole system of training put in place in order to counterbalance uh, what Hogger argued and many of his pupils argued in the 1740s and 50s. Not surprisingly, exactly in this period, uh, also, uh, also uh, the theory of art started to support this centrality, this renewed centrality of Raphael, because now you, do, you have not only the Raphael cartoons, the copies of Raphael cartoons, prints from Raphael cartoons, but also you have a Rome in London, a Translatio Rome in London, where, where in the gallery of Northumberland House. So on one hand, you have in 1768, and I will stop here and round up and conclude, in 1768, with the foundation of the Royal Academy, the centrality of Raphael, together with Michelangelo, which is a peculiar British uh, uh, love, but that's a different story, the centrality of Raphael is stressed again in the discourses of Sir Joshua Reynolds. And also very interesting in order to support again the centrality of Raphael in the newly established Royal Academy of London in 1768, which in a way replaces the system put in place by the Society of Arts 10 years before. A translation of, uh, uh, of Ludovico Dolce Aretino, the first English translation of Ludovico Dolce Aretino, is published in England. And bear in mind that in England, only the Pictura and the Statue of Alberti, some of the treatises of Leonardo, and the treatise by Count Algarotti have been, have been translated into English throughout the whole of the 18th century. So it's quite meaningful that immediately after the foundation of the Royal Academy in 1768, you have a new translation, uh, the only translation in English of Dolce with a huge commentary, anonymous, unfortunately, where actually it is said that uh, this is not the, uh, I, this is, the Aretino is not the product of Dolce, but is what Dolce heard from, from Raphael. So it's given a sort of like semi-mythical status. And you know very well how in the Aretino, the figure and the centrality of Raphael in terms of grazia, in terms of proportion, etc., etc., is reinforced. This Actually, again, there's a new theory is produced in print at the beginning of the, of the English Academy in, 17, in the 1710, and in a way at the end of the effort when the Academy is established finally. You need a theory to support the practice in that sense, with Raphael at its end. So to conclude, was this centrality of the Raphael cartoons and the Raphael and the, <coughs> sorry, and the cult of Raphael uh, successful in order to promote history painting in England? Well, yes and no. Yes, because uh, as you've seen, of course, uh, the diffusion of the cartoons of Raphael was really used in order to structure the new uh, English art world and the new academy. And generation after generation of artists trained on Raphael and the cartoons. So indeed, uh, it really helped establishing a solid school of design, at least from the 1750s onwards. And no, because the arrival of this uh, uh, pedagogical system, which borrows from Rome and Paris, arrived too late. In a way, arrived too late. And those forces that actually were epitomized by Hoggart uh, were too strong. The British society in the 18th century is not, in a way, a society of the Ancien Regime is a constitutional monarchy. The mercantile and middle classes are exploding. It's a very commercial society where individual freedom is one of the tropes of the 18th century. And in fact, in a way, if Hoggart failed and the model supported by the Society of Artists with Raphael at its center triumphed in the Royal Academy, on the long term, so in the long durée, Hoggart was right because uh, history painting really never took off in Britain. 
And really, actually, the, the British school is famous for portrait, for landscape, for modern subjects, for national subjects derived from Shakespeare, Milton, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So, in a way, we could conclude that actually Britain in the 18th century is really interesting because it, it really it, it's a laboratory to see how the old and the new dialogued and sometimes clashed, and to also to see how basically a pedagogical uh, a model and a theory that actually was really devised within ancien regime society, where the church and the court held the reign of patronage, really was applied to a completely different context, much more modern, that in a way prefigures what will happen in Europe in the next century. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you, Adriano. That was fantastic. And I have to say, I mean, uh, uh, the, the image that I will take away from that talk, but the, the words matter a lot, but the image that I'll take away is the Battle of the Paintings, um, <laughs> which I'll, I'll never be able to get out of my head, I don't think. Um, uh, but, but what I appreciate, too, is, the, is that sense of the, the, the contentiousness of it. And, you know, a book that was very influential, very important for me in my early years in architecture was Joseph Rickward's The First Moderns the subtitle of which was The, Ar the Architects of the 18th Century. Um, and I think what you've, you've given us is some sense in which the battles, like you said at the end, that would play out later are battle lines that were drawn already in the 18th century. Um, and, and that's true to a certain extent with what Olivier has told us about, in some sense, the diminishing interest in Raphael over the course of the, the 18th century, or at least the uh, diminishing reference to him. But what I, what I would like to ask, and then I would like to open it up to um, any of the other presenters, I would like to ask, though, that for our audience, uh, if you have a question, please submit it through the Q&A function at the bottom of your screen on the right. Um, but the, the question I would like to ask both Olivier and, um, and Adriano, and this is in light of what Ingrid told us, is um, I, I'm interested to know, because you, you, you talked mostly, and, and I think rightly so, about Raphael's work and, and the impact of Raphael's work on the academic tradition in both England and France. What about the idea of Raphael that sort of emerges in Bazzotti that is, um, you know, sort of restated by Bellori in the 17th century? The ideal of Raphael as the kind of consummate artist embodied in his very persona, the nature, who he was as a person and, and how he went about doing what he did was as important or not as important as the work itself? Yeah. And I would just be curious to hear your, your take on that. Olivier, shall I? For Britain, Please. but also for France, I think. You have to remember that actually the, the, the England didn't even have a translation of Bazaar at the beginning of the 18th century. There's Allenby in his painting illustrated in 1685, who actually pr produces some abstract from Bazaar, among which the biography of Raphael amended. But certainly, I think in the, this is a very uh, general observation, the fact that the academy from the beginning of the 17th century, whether Roman, French, or English, later on, you name it, embraces Raphael as its champion rather than Michelangelo. Michelangelo is always a very difficult figure within academic practices an academic pedagogical curriculum is yes, first of all, for, for reasons that are related to his art, because his art is based more on classical proportions, the elongations, distortions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, that uh, are present, especially in the late Michelangelo, were not very favored in certain academic circles in the 17th and 18th century. But also, this has a lot to do with Raphael being, of course, the new appell and the champion of grace, but also has a lot to do with his own uh, conduct. He was, uh, uh, he had a huge uh, school, unlike Michelangelo. He was always willing to teach to his pupils. He left an enormous amount of drawings. He promoted engravings after his own work. So in a way, the model that actually he provides, also in terms of behavior, because of course he was well-mannered, he was at least, this is emergence, especially from Dolce Aretino. I know that Vasari is incredibly important, but the Aretino by Ludovico Dolce, which will have an immense 
impact in the 18th century is translated and reproduced uh, uh, 20 times in the 18th century and also is translated in, in, uh, in, in is reprinted in the in the 17th century and is, I think is one of the foundational uh, uh, treatises for uh, the development of classicism, paradoxically, because it's a treatise that actually uh, is there to support the, the Venetian school rather than anything else. But Raphael is the champion against Michelangelo and the Aretino. The, this enormous uh, uh, impact that the Aretino by Dolce will have on French art theory in the 17th century and on European academic theory in the 18th century is really based on the cult of Raphael as a person as well. In the Aretino, you have uh, Raphael being well-mannered, being capable of, uh, uh, of establishing a dialogue with the rich uh, with the, and the kings, being on equal terms is the ideal the intellectual artist that can dialogue with it. So certainly to cut, sorry, I'm, I'm talking too much. So uh, um, indeed also uh, his own life conduct uh, had an enormous impact in the way he was perceived and used within the academy in that sense. I don't know if Olivier agrees. <laughs> uh, not <laughs> totally, because in France, the situation is a little different. Uh, they have not only to kill Raphael as a painter, but also as a life of painting, as life of a painter. And so there was a first translation of uh, Vasari's life uh, about Raphael, uh, quite early between 1650, when uh, Philippe uh, wrote his, uh, the, his Entretien, he's doing a little changement for him. Raphael is a painter of uh, perhaps of the beauty, but of the grass, something which is not French, not at all. He's going from God. And Raphael is also someone who is uh, submitted to the um, sexual desire, more or less, terrestrial, terrestrial desires. Uh, so uh, for Fabien, it was uh, Jules Romain, Julio Romano, which was uh, the best one. It was the painter of the court. Uh, it was a painter who realized uh, painting so not for the not for the Pope, but for a prince. And it was a painter also who was who can do the, the synthesis between uh, Raphael, uh, Raphael and Michelangelo, as the French art will be the synthesis of the different arts. And after for Roger de Pille, it was Rubens who was more important. Rubens was a painter of the court for Spain, for the, uh, also for the king. In, uh, in England. And uh, so I think in France, the idea of Raphael was not so much important, neither as a painter, neither as an elaborate artist. As a figure of artist. Presenters have a question, um, because we actually have a series of questions. We ne may not get to all of them in the Q&A panel, but um, Jeffrey or Ingrid, would you like to pose anything? No? Jeffrey? Okay, thank you. Well, so uh, we have um, Pamela Graham from our office who will, will read the, the questions in the Q&A as, they, as they've as they come in. And if we don't get to all of them now, we, we can pick up on them uh, at the end of the, uh, the uh, afternoon or morning, depending on where you are. Pamela? Thank you. thank you, David. Our first question arrived during Adriano's talk. And the question is, uh, were Raphael's works in public places? Could wealthy individuals buy a Raphael? Were, were there still uh, Raphaels is, on the market? Uh, yeah, there were very few, but there were in the sense that um, if there were not very many, there were not very many 16th century paintings in England in the 18th century, despite the huge collect campaigns of, uh, of collecting by English aristocrats on the Grand Tour, uh, notably Vendramin family by Titian and Northumberland House, Saint Poussin, anyway, many others. Raphael, not at all. The first Raphael that comes up on the market is the Anci Dei Madonna, which arrived in, in 1764. 
or 67 and, and, and goes to Blenheim Castle for the Duke of Marlborough. But that's very much it. And then later on is only with the Orleans sale and then the Camuccini collections acquired in the 19th century that a huge influx of Raphael arrives in England, the Madonna of the Pink, for instance. But uh, that's the reason why, in a way, the Raphael cartoons were so important in England in the first half of the century, even in the second half of the century, because uh, they were the only original Raphael on a large scale to be seen in Britain. The Ancide Madonna was tucked away at Blenheim Castle and arrives only later on. So it's, um, and even if they were, uh, they were not visible for artists. So uh, that's why I think the Duke of Northumberland decided to spend an enormous amount of money in the opening of that uh, gallery, which usually is considered just a, a product of collecting and patronage, but it is clearly used for pedagogical purposes within the system of the Society of Art. Uh, England in the 18th century is not a very good place to be, at least at the beginning, for an artist. Thank you, Adriano. The second question is from our uh, colleague, Stephen Sams. He asks uh, Adriano uh, how Sir Joshua Reynolds and his discourses enter into the story of the reception of Raphael in England. <clears throat> yeah, I, I will touch only briefly about that because I think that's a different, a completely different period in, 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 the, in the development of, of English art. Reynolds was, uh, and of course, in my narrative, I decided to privilege his praise of Raphael, but Reynolds was equally uh, 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 an enthusi enthusiast of Michelangelo. And this is really uh, uh, meaningful of a, diff a change of taste uh, in British aesthetic in the late 18th century with the arrival of the aesthetic of the sublime. Remember that Burke philosophical inquire into the, into the Sublime and the Beautiful is published in 1757 and will have an enormous impact in the second half of the century. And remember also that artists like Barry and Fusely will be uh, teaching and will be uh, at the Royal Academy. So really the cult of Michelangelo really actually takes off at the end of the 18th century. But, but having said so, Raphael appears in innumerable passages of Reynolds' discourses, especially in terms of grace, grazia, which again is a term which is central to uh, the artistic theory of, of the humanistic theory of art and changes uh, from place to place, from century to century, the concept of grazia. So it's, it's one of the uh, most important elements. In terms of composition, in terms of invention, he takes on from Richardson, Reynolds, very much. However, in the practices of the academy, Reynolds is uh, uh, against the direct copy of drawings and prints and old masters, because he says that actually the artist should instead apply imitatio rather than direct copy, because the direct copy is, uh, is just a mechanical exercise, while the, the imitatio needs invention, so it needs basically the imagination. Uh, uh, and the individuality of the art. So it's complex in a way, but nonetheless, uh, uh, the uh, uh, Northumberland House was used by Royal Academicians throughout the, 20, the late part of the 18th century. And remember that from 1800, uh, which I couldn't touch upon, the uh, copies, the full-size copies by Thornhill were bequeathed to the Royal Academy. So all the academic discourses and lectures by Turner, by Benjamin West, uh, by Fusley and Westmacott happened in front of uh, Raphael cartoons and they are constantly uh, the copies of Raphael cartoons and uh, one of the cartoons is even bore, is even lent to the Royal Academy in 1820. So I would say that there's a resurgence of centrality of Raphael's in academic circles in the first half of the 19th century. And hence uh, in 1848, you have the pre-Raphaelite secession in a way. Thank you, Adriano. Our next question uh, is for Ingrid. Could you comment on the role of invention and imagination, Raphael? What do we know about his education that would enable him to come up with the composition for the School of Athens? And that's a much debated question. My personal feeling is that he's talking 
for the School of Athens to three people. One of them is Tommaso Ingirami, who's on the left-hand side of the painting as Epicurus. He was the private librarian of Pope Julius II. He was the greatest actor in Renaissance Rome. He was himself a scholar. He commented on Horace. But above all, he was a fantastic orator and an actor. And so he knew how to block people, say, on a stage. And there's something about the blocking of the figures in the School of Athens that I think he must have talked it over with Ingirami. If it's true that the room on which the School of Athens is painted is Julius II's private library, then that's the librarian right there, which means that Raphael can talk to this person who's 13 years older than he is, but just famously a great conversationalist. So I think that's one part. Part of it, the theology, I think, is Giles of Viterbo, who was the preferred theologian of Pope Julius II, extremely busy. At that point, he was the head of the largest religious order in the Catholic world, the Augustinian Hermits. But he's also the pet preacher for Julius II, so that anytime Julius has a fundraiser, he'll pull out Giles B. Terrible, and as a great sermonist, he's also somebody who knows how to explain things complicated or complicated things simply to people so that they can really take something out of it. So you've got his theology, I think you've got Ingirami in a way digesting it. You've also got Donato Bramante, his distant uncle who brought him to Rome, who's turned into a great architect in the meantime. And we know that Raphael liked to talk to people. We know Bramante liked to talk to people. We know that Ingirami did. So I think what you're seeing is a conversational group that are getting together. And Raphael, as Vasari notes, and as you can see in the paintings, is just a human vacuum. He's just taking up every kind of information that he can have. He's a great student. We know that from his edition that he's making of Vitruvius, where he has Vitruvius translated for him by a scholar, but he also has his Latin copy and he writes notes so he can read some of the Latin himself. And he's just an amazing person. One of the things that I learned and I was asked to write about the School of Athens and Diogenes Laertius's Lives of the Philosophers, which were supposedly popular in Rome. And I thought, great, I'll just go find a nice manuscript that everybody used. It turns out everybody in Rome, except for Giles of Viterbo, who can read Greek, maybe a few other people, are using vernacular trots that were written in the Middle Ages and republished as super cheap paperback editions. And so I think what he's also using is one of these super cheap little paperback vernacular lives of the philosophers. And so he's got his handy dandy cliff note that are helping him. And so for you as an artist, I think you're as strong and as educated as your friends. Mm. It's always, that's why David and I are friends, because what we don't know, we can ask the other one. Lucky me. I, that, um, that, that will be a lovely way to transition into our um, presentations by two practitioners. Uh, we'll have a short break. Um, we're a little, now a little behind, but we'll take a between three and five minute break, um, and we will be back and have two more presentations and then another round of questions. Thank you.
See, we are now passing from scholars to artists, so the scholar is going to introduce the artist. <laughs> and it seems totally appropriate, given what was just said about Raphael, having friends who were scholars. It's, we're stronger when we work together and inspire each other together. Though Jeffrey Mims is a painter, educator, lecturer, and muralist who has been at the forefront of the revival of the classical tradition for the past 40 years. Mims attended the Rhode Island School of Design and the Pennsylvania Academy of Fine Arts. In 1976, he received a Green Shields Foundation grant to support independent study in the museums of England, France, and Italy, and in 1981, returned to Florence, Italy, where he studied with the American painter Benjamin F. Long. For over a decade, he maintained studios in Italy and the US, during which time he executed both easel and public mural paintings. In recognition for his work in traditional fresco painting, Classical America presented Mims with an Arthur Ross Award in 1984 for, quote, excellence and integrity in the application of classical ideals, end quote. He was awarded an affiliated fellowship at the American Academy in Rome in 2009 from the Institute of Classical Architecture and Art, and is a past member of the Intbau College of Traditional Practitioners. Mims has lectured on historic collaborations between artists and architects for, among other organizations, the ICAA and the University of Notre Dame. D. Jeffrey Mims is founder and director of the Academy of Classical Design, a school of fine art with an emphasis on traditional mural painting and architectural decoration. The Academy serves as the educational branch of the Classical Design Foundation, a US-based nonprofit which was established for the preservation and practice of classical design in the public realm. Jeffrey, take it away. Thank you, Ingrid. It, 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 David, it's some comfort to hear that even the Pope had someone who could explain things in very simple terms. A cartoon like a poem can be an abbreviation of a much more complex story. It's often a story that can be interpreted different ways. We might see the first three here as working within a tradition, and the fourth, the caveman, working without a tradition. Working within a tradition is to have the accumulated knowledge of generations. Jeffrey, I'm sorry to interrupt, but your screen share didn't work, so we're not seeing the images. All right, can someone tell me what we need to do here? You just need to push that green button at the bottom with the arrow to share your slides. Lo già fatto. All right, I pressed the green button. How does that work? You press the green button, it'll pull up. You wanna select the box that has your presentation in it. And then down at the bottom, you'll push the blue button that says share. All right. That didn't do it. I don't have an IT group working with me here. What do you see on your screen now? I see my PowerPoint now. And I see the blue Zoom button. When I click that, nothing happens. 
can you get back to the screen where you can see the, the green screen, share screen button? Yes, I press share screen and then my PowerPoint. When you press share screen, oh, there you go. You got it. Okay. You're all set now, sorry. Thank you. I suppose we ought to um, I'm having trouble getting into the full screen mode here. Right down at the bottom, right where your cursor is, near where the 72 is, hit the um, the second icon that'll start your slideshow. Yes, it's covered by a, a, a menu that I don't know how to get rid of. I just requested remote control. If you give me that, I'll turn it on for you and then I'll Please get it do. How's that? There you go. I suppose we ought to review if we didn't see the first slides because the silence uh, meant something. And this led us to talking about working within a tradition which is to have the accumulated knowledge of generations. But it begins with something as simple as copying or what the ancients called imitation. This comes from a once famous book of allegorical icons. We see two artists, both working from nature. The lady sees nature through the eyes of tradition and elevates it with a concept of the ideal. The little monkey simply copies nature directly aping the random appearance of things. Now, Leonardo recommended that artists work directly from nature, but Leonardo was certainly no ape. And if we look more carefully at his advice, it was to study first with a master in order to learn how to see nature. In fact, Bernini took the idea further and stated that it was dangerous to draw from nature at the beginning. But then he was talking about obsolete things like taste and judgment and beauty. Most every European art academy taught this idea of seeing nature through a balance of traditional conventions and observation. That is up until the late 19th century when the conventions that had been so important for that balance were discarded one by one in pursuit of a realism for its own sake. And at that point, photography was conveniently ushered in as the logical alternative. Anyone who has ever suffered through a university art history course has probably seen this comparison of the early Greek chorus figure to the much earlier Egyptian figure from which it was derived. The Egyptian prototype had been maintained for thousands of years with hardly any changes. But how and from where it was derived is a mystery. Though there are some very interesting theories. None of those proven, so we'll move on. So just what is classical antiquity? Well, for the artist, it is idealized human form, a profound observation of nature, but harmonized with an intellectual construction Classical antiquity was also this. And already just 100 years later, moving into Hellenistic times, we start to see the emphasis shift toward realism, considered by some to be a decline in art, the ideal and the real. These two concepts, I think could be used to interpret the central hand gestures in Raphael's School of Athens. Plato to our left gestures up to represent an ideal reality of pure concept, while Aristotle to the right holds his hand down to
to represent a reality based on observation, what we know and what we see. As Raphael's early years of imitation developed into masterworks of imagination, this was his genius really, the ability to combine concept with observation, the ideal and the real, and transform all of his influences into a balanced classicism that emerged as the model to be emulated. Nicolas Poussin was the first French artist to gain an international reputation. He spent most of his life in Rome and was strongly influenced by Raphael's classicism. Nicolas Chaperon, another French artist who worked with Poussin in Rome, makes very clear here the esteem in which Raphael was held during this period. This is a painting by Chaperon. It is one of the museum paintings I copied back in the 1970s while trying to learn from a tradition that had very nearly been extinguished. And I insert this image for the amusement of Professor Mayernick. Anyway, back to our story. The French would not be content for long to have their best and most talented artists absorbed into Roman culture. They had other thoughts like global domination of culture and the arts. But the funny thing is they did it. Within two decades of the Academy's founding, they managed to turn an Italianate taste among a small group of history painters into an officially sanctioned institution, the French Academy. The idea was to transform the humble guild worker, with apologies to St. Luke here, into a gentleman and a scholar fit to dine at the king's table, as we see here in the portrait of Charles Lebrun, who also studied in Rome with Poussin and made copies after Raphael while there. Meanwhile, as we've heard, the English artist would have to wait another 100 years before the establishment of a Royal Academy would confer similar respect to someone like poor Mr. Heyman here, one of its founding members seated on the floor. This is a portion of the great hemicycle in the Ecole painted by Delaroche in the 19th century. It's a wonderfully imagined grouping of all the great artists of Europe. And though most everyone here is looking quite respectable in this setting, it's clearly Raphael who stands out as the prince of painters. Ingres, another 19th century French artist, painted this monumental apotheosis of Homer. Among the few, quote, moderns allowed into this gathering, we notice Poussin in the lower left corner, who gestures up to Apelles, the great painter from antiquity, who leads none other than Raphael himself by the hand. That's Raphael there in the black and white. By invoking this connection of artistic ancestors, the French Academy promoted a genealogy that established the moderns as heirs to the classical tradition. In an age before Instagram, pre de Rome winners were required to make copies from Renaissance masterpieces. And these were meant not only for the training of the copyist, but also to build an educational collection of copies to benefit those back in Paris who could not spend time in Rome. The practice of having copies made, especially from Raphael, was adopted from the French model as other European centers began to establish their own academies of art like the Russian Academy here. Catherine the Great went one step further and had a complete replica built of Raphael's famous Vatican Loggia. With the completion of the Sistine ceiling, Michelangelo changed the course of art history forever and had done so in a chapel that could have already defined the Renaissance through an earlier program of frescoes led by Raphael's teacher, Perugino. Now imagine Raphael, the new artist in town, invited to add to the decoration of this space. How does he compete with that? Well, Raphael does what he always does. 
he takes the best parts from each model and combines them, harmonizing the power and movement of Michelangelo with the narrative clarity of the earlier works. Executed as tapestries, I was surprised to learn a luxury prized even above fresco painting, for which they had to be drawn in reverse. It was one more victory for the young Raphael, but a short-lived one. What we see here is a reassembled set because the originals were destroyed along with so many other wonderful things during the sack of Rome. Meanwhile, the original cartoon drawings that Adriano has told us about were lost as well for at least nearly a century until they were mysteriously rediscovered and purchased by the future King Charles of England, who placed them on public display at Hampton Court. And as we heard before, in the early 1700s, the British artist Sir James Thornhill painted full-scale copies from these Raphael cartoons, which were purchased and donated to the Royal Academy schools for the use of the students there. If I juxtapose a detail from the original, we can see that the copy was actually quite good. And if I remove the color, the comparison may be easier to see. Of course, they both lose something of their magic like this, but it helps our eyes transition to the next image, which shows a section of the acclaimed new Royal Academy campus where the Raphael copies are now displayed. Fortunately, the original cartoons ended up in what is called the Raphael Court at the Victorian Albert Museum, which recently, as we heard, underwent a major renovation as part of the 500th anniversary that we're celebrating today, with an incredible web page that will let you, if I may say, zoom right into the pounce holes where the transfers were made, and you can see microscopically almost every detail of these remarkable works. Well, this print shows an area of the museum shortly after opening with a temporary copy of the School of Athens in place to serve as a sort of mock-up for a planned mosaic copy. In the end, the mosaic proved too expensive and instead Frederick Layton, president of the Royal Academy, was commissioned to paint an original composition. The strength of Leighton's design and concept based on his emulation of Raphael remains to be recognized as one of the great pinnacles of 19th century mural work. Now, this is only my opinion, but to borrow a phrase from the distinguished Scottish sculptor, Sandy Stoddart, it is an informed opinion. You can see the comparison here. Similar, but not really the same. The architectural setting, the frieze running horizontally across the center of the lunette shape, the groupings to the left and the right. I would draw your attention to this series of niches running around the upper arcade level, barely visible in this historic photo. One of the proposals for this space was this inventive image of the young Raphael working on his allegorical figure of poetry. But while we recognize the harp, the ancient symbol of poetry, we notice the scale is too small. The ornamental surround is completely different. And not only that, he's painting on a wall, not the ceiling. A friend sent me this photo of the dining hall at the American Academy in Rome during my time there in 2009. In the upper right, we see a more faithful copy of Raphael's figure of poetry. I hope it's still there. It is, of course, terribly outdated when compared to the playground of ephemera that passes for most contemporary art today. But there it hangs anyway, above the mantelpiece, as a reminder of a time when painters came here to actually engage with and learn from the artistic legacy of Rome. It's interesting to see how this same figure of poetry has been adapted in other unexpected ways. This copy translated into ceramic tiles 
is by that student of Ang, Paul Balls, who had a distinguished career as a copyist. In fact, his reputation was such that he was commissioned to make this copy of the School of Athens in the 1850s for Thomas Jefferson's University of Virginia. Sadly, it was lost in the fire that destroyed the rotunda along with the mural. The architectural firm of McKim, Mead and White was called in to restore and expand the campus, including a replacement mural that remains to this day as the auditorium backdrop for the university's music department. And what I found most interesting is that it was painted by a former director of the American Academy. Sorry about the watermarks on this image, but it was the best I could find to show how each of the ceiling Tondo figures correspond with their more highly elaborated themes in the frescoes below. At the very top of this image, we can just make out the cropped figure of poetry that we've been looking at. She's directly across from the figure of justice. And it was this Tondo that I chose as the subject for a collaborative copy project at our academy. Access to the Vatican is not what it once was for the copyist. And I was so jealous listening to how the scaffolding sat there for years and years. But the internet provided enough information for our copy to be made the same size as the original. We began the project using a freehand technique adapted from our full-time curriculum. Once the correct relationships of shapes had been established, detailed sections were then modeled up to a fairly high degree of finish using charcoal heightened with white chalk. Next, the shadow contours were outlined in red chalk and the excess charcoal vacuumed off before the underpainting began. Here we can just see the arm of the justice figure ready to receive the green underpainting or redaccio in Italian, and so on until the entire charcoal drawing had been replaced with the underpainting and ready for the final layers of color. As a teaching tool, certain areas of our Raphael copy were intentionally left unfinished to document the technical process. For those of us who view the legacy of art, not as a locked vault of treasures, but as a guide to new possibilities. There's no substitute for the tradition of copying. Our choice to copy this particular section from Raphael's ceiling was made not only for the idealized figurative work, but also to experience other elements of architectural decoration. In copying the ornamental border, for instance, there were lessons about alternating patterns, the geometry involved for correct spacing of these patterns use of complementary colors, trompe l'oeil effects, and then the exaggerations required for all these relationships to carry correctly at a distance. How everything's affected again by the addition of gold leaf. Rosettes were modeled, cast, and attached to the axis points of the border. Lessons which we later adapted for use in our own library ceiling. These are a few of the preparatory cartoon drawings being made now for the decoration of our cast hall. A studio space I designed for students to learn the fundamentals of drawing and painting, but also as a space to train advanced students in fresco and mural painting techniques. The decoration of the lunettes and the vaulted ceiling will move from the idea of imitation to imagination, a path so clearly represented in Raphael's own astonishing development. But let me give the last word here to another painter with a much better command of the English language than I could ever hope to have, Sir Joshua Reynolds. And he said, the more extensive, therefore, your acquaintance with the works of those who have excelled, the more extensive will be your powers of invention. And what may appear still more like a paradox, the more original will be your conceptions. 
And he had this to say specifically about Raphael. Always imitating and always original. Thank you, that concludes my talk. Ingrid, you're muted. Okay. <laughs> I'll start again with David Mayernick, whom I met at the American Academy in Rome when in the midst of fellows presentations, he put up an allegory of truth. And it turned out to be the one thing absolutely nobody expected that an artist would ever do these days. <laughs> this hush fell over the room and David, soldiered on, it was one of those moments. And so I ran up and had to know this person and we've been talking to each other ever since. <laughs> David is now an associate professor in the School of Architecture at Notre Dame. He's an artist and award-winning architect. So he, like Raphael, there's that whole side of Raphael we haven't talked about, the architect. A graduate of the school in 1983, at 26, he and his classmate, Thomas Reykjavich, won the international competition for the Minnesota State Capitol Grounds, which won an Arthur Bross Award from Classical America the following year. At 35, he was named one of the top 40 architects in the United States under 40 years old. A fellow of Notre Dame's Nanovic Institute for European Studies, the American Academy in Rome, and the Royal Society for the Encouragement of Arts, Manufacturers, and Commerce. He's a winner of the Gabriel Prize for Research in France. His architectural practice is focused on international schools and his work for Tassis in Switzerland garnered a Palladio Award from Traditional Building Magazine. He studied fresco painting with Leonetto Tintori and has painted frescoes for the American Academy, the Church of San Cresci in Balclava in Tuscany, and his own buildings at Tassis, Switzerland, not to mention the ones he's done for students here to show them how it's done and how terribly difficult. For several seasons, he painted stage sets for the Haymarket Opera Company of Chicago's performances of Baroque operas, and he won the competition to paint the Palio for his adopted city of Lucca in 2013. He's the author of Timeless Cities and Architects Reflections on Renaissance Italy and the Challenge of Emulation in Art and Architecture between Imitation and Invention, and recently the chapter on the Baroque City for the Oxford Handbook of the Baroque. His course, The Meaning of Rome, on the edX platform had 6,000 students from around the world when it was live in 2016, and it's still alive and well. <laughs> David. <laughs> Thank you, Ingrid. Now, I, I, because I organized this event, um, I gave myself the last word, but I don't mean it to be the last word in, in any absolute sense, but it's a way of thinking about where we might go from here. Um, so after Raphael is a question about the future as much as it is about the past. And the future of Raphael hangs on, for me, one question in particular, which Raphael or whose Raphael? And that's a question to which I'll return at the end. To an extent, we've already heard about how different the answers to the, that question can actually be. And I have my own answer, which is, which is what I'm going to lay out for you here today. As a sort of essentially um, organizing tool, let's say, for this argument, I designed a, uh, an imaginary project of, a, of a, or an academy for Raphael studies. 
that is the drawing that you see here is the analytique of that project, and I will explain a, a bit of it in the next couple of slides. And it's meant to be a model of what I'm proposing or advocating, and, a, and a, in a way, a metaphor. It's, a, it's an example of what it's uh, essentially advocating. Um, what you're seeing here is the analytique, so it's a combination of a variety of images of the, of the project, plan in particular in the center, you know, sort of organizing the sheet. On the left is a detail of a corner, which I can, um, is, is that this large scale detail here is, is this corner of uh, the, a sort of a, a secondary element of the facade. Um, this is the Via Paola, which leads from to the right, San Giovanni di Fiorentini to the left, will take you to the Ponte Sant'Angelo. The uh, elevation is treated as an architectural model in wood, a half elevation, and it's juxtaposed with the section which is treated as a drawing. Now, in many ways, the genesis for this, for me, came from the plan that Raphael proposed for a house for himself on the Via Giulia. And that plan, which is so sophisticated, and Ingrid just said, we haven't really talked about architecture, but I think it's incumbent on me as the architect here to do that. Um, this house of Raphael's, uh, which is designed just before he dies and it's never realized, uh, for a site on the Via Giulia, is actually not one house, but it's in fact two. There's a larger palazzo entered from the bottom in this plan, which would be on the Via Giulia. Packed on the back side is a smaller house, uh, a kind of a mini palazzo that helps resolve the complex geometry of the site. In fact, it's an incredibly sophisticated solution to the problem of this particular site. It has some unusual characteristics. We can tell from the plan there are no elevations that survive. But the pilasters on the plan are the scale of a colossal order. So it would have been wrapped by a colossal order on all sides. So it's a noble building. It's an elegant resolution of a complex problem. It's actually two buildings nested together. And I believe it actually has some affinities with the double portrait of Raphael and the person who is called his friend, maybe his fencing master, who I would like to believe is Julia Romano. And in the same way that those two figures are intertwined in that portrait, this may be very well a palazzo, not just for Raphael himself, but for his favorite assistant, Julia Romano, on the, on the back of it. And, and so there's, a, a, I think, a, a kind of a way in which this palace is a kind of a portrait of Raphael. And uh, I used it as essentially a, a genesis point for the, the project that I have created. So this is that plan turned into what we architects like to call a Noli plan after Noli's map. And here it is inserted into the Noli map where it would have been on the Via Giulia. Um, that currently that block of buildings is actually occupied by three buildings. In the middle of it is the uh, my favorite bar in the morning for my cappuccino. And I would argue one of the finest bars in all of Rome, albeit small. Um, and that site is uh, obviously, it was never realized. It's occupied by, like I said, three buildings. But that whole area, as you see in the Catasto plan to the right, has been radically transformed and argue, arguably um, fragmented and ruined by the imposition first of the Corso Vittorio Emanuele coming from the Ponte Vittorio Emanuele uh, in the 19th century, late 19th century. And then from the left is the Ponte Principe Amedeo from the 20th century, in, which sponsors the Via Acciaioli. And the intersection of those two streets essentially dissolved and fragmented what fabric there was there. And so my project actually begins with an urban infill project to essentially repair the damage to the site by infilling all the missing bits and reestablishing the texture. But I also then focused on the Palazzo for the Raphael Academy. And here it is in the lower left shown at the orientation in the site plan. And then I'll, it'll come up in the orientation onto the, the sheet where we can see it on the left, the piano, the uh, ground floor, the piano nobile in the middle, and the second floor on the right. The, the ground floor plan has shops on Corso Vittoria, which is the left flank. The bottom has a loggia on the, um, on the Via Paola, so it creates a more honorific processional route between San Giovanni and, and the Ponte San Angelo. The Piano Nobile is really, the, in many ways, the academy proper. So it's the public and semi-public functions of the academy, a grand salone in the center, which would be a combination of library, reading room, uh, lecture hall, uh, concert venue, 
uh, is flanked on the right by a rare books room, on the left by a cast hall, and then marching down the side on Corso Vittorio Emanuele, or a, a life drawing studio, some library rooms again, and a, a room dedicated to copies after Raphael's work. Finally, on the top floor is the uh, artist studios on the left, so facing more or less north onto Corso Vittorio Emanuele, and at the bottom along Via Paola are two large apartments for a visiting artist and a visiting scholar who share a common salone. Beyond the architecture, the project integrates painting, sculpture, and architecture to create a, a complex iconographic program that illustrates this idea of the formation of an artist from imitation to emulation to invention. So beginning with imitation, from Raphael's Santa Cecilia altarpiece that's in Bologna, I took the figure of St. Paul, and he's now inserted into that niche at the top of that small bit of the facade in the, uh, in the analytique on, on the right. That figure is oriented towards people who will be moving under the loggia or down Via Paola to, um, to the Ponte San Angelo. So it's an iconographic reference, but it's also an example of imitation, albeit painting transformed into sculpture. Below that figure is a panel with a fresco that contains a Madonna and Child, which is my exercise in emulation of Raphael's compositions of Madonnas and Child. So the, the oil is in fact an oil painting on the left and I inserted it into the drawing as a fresco. And, and then finally, with respect to invention, in the upper right of the analytique is a roundel that is a, uh, meant to be a ceiling painting in the central Salone. And it is obviously inspired by Raphael's painting of the Three Graces from the Villa Farnesina. But it doesn't, in fact, represent the Three Graces. It actually represents grace uniting theory and practice. <laughs> and that, for me, is, in a way, the essence of Raphael's achievement. And it's a subject to which I'm now going to turn, and we're going to leave that project. So it, it's one of the great dramatic problems of the academic tradition is the tension between theory and practice, and sometimes an unresolved tension, and the battles that happen throughout the history of the academic tradition between the primacy of theory and practice. And, and it is Raphael's achievement to have seamlessly integrated them, that he is a, a, an elegant practitioner of a theory that he espouses and manifests in his person, and in his work. And in Cesare Ripa's Econologia, work from which these two these uh, figures of, of theory on the left, uh, who's a young woman with a compass on her head, um, the older woman with the large compass measuring on the right is practice. Ripa says that being therefore two extremes, theory and practice are in some ways opposites. Theory and practice are united nevertheless in one way, at one point only, which is the knowledge of the good. And the knowledge of the good is essentially that, that, um, that goal of the artist. And in fact, we've actually heard that not the good actually so much as the perfect. It's, it's grace that in Raphael mediates and unites theory and practice. I count 30 instances in Vasari's life of Raphael, the words grace, graceful, or gracious. It is perhaps his most defining characteristic. He painted the three graces early in his career in the painting on the left. In the detail from a print on the right by Carlo Maratta, who's arguably one of the great successors of Raphael's academic tradition, in the larger image, there are a series of disciplines that, that Maratta thinks the artist needs to uh, know about. Um, perspective, anatomy, geometry, th these are all labeled with the, the phrase tanto che basti, as, as much as enough, so don't overindulge in these things. Um, then with the figure of a classical uh, uh, figure of uh, uh, an Apollo, he writes, Maya Bastanza, that the study of antiquity, there is never enough that you can do. But finally, presiding over all of this at the top are the three graces, behind which are, are written, senza di noi ogni fatica è vana. With, without us, without grace, every effort is in vain. So you can labor at, um, at, at all those other aspects of the artistic discipline that you're in, in, imbibing in the academy. But if you don't practice them all with grace, your efforts are in vain. So for me, 
this idea of a future of Raphael is, I, I, from my sense at least, informed by um, recent scholarship and recent uh, restorations of the Raphael frescoes. And I'll talk about the fresco restorations at the end of my talk. Uh, a fundamental text for me that I've read recently and uh, was by Robert Williams, Raphael and the Redefinition of Art in Renaissance Italy. Sadly came out just before Williams passed away too young. Um, for Ra Robert Williams, who's trying to get at what it was that Raphael did that did redefine art in Renaissance Italy, he has, I, I would argue, three themes that he, he spends quite a lot of time developing in the book. One is this, um, I think, rather infelicitous word that he uses, systematicity, which he defines as a, a sort of a, a defining quality of Raphael. It's, you might say it's um, Raphael's method, uh, methodical approach to what he does, his deliberateness, his, his use of reason in essentially solving problems as an artist, and that has to do with his artistic process. Then with respect to decorum, which is an essential characteristic of the classical tradition and arguably the academic tradition, um, he doesn't mean decorum in the way that it's often used, which has to do with comportment, Raphael's decorous comportment as a person, nor really the decorum that has to do with style. But decorum is for narrative, that what decorum is about is the appropriateness of form to its narrative function. So that has to do with gesture, it has to do with visage, it might have to do with costume, it has to do with color. All of those things are in the service of narrative and therefore in the service of invention. And then finally, the idea of art as work, but not necessarily just as labor, as effort, but as a collaborative production. And this is what Raphael adds to the um, essentially atelier tradition that he was born into. The idea that the people working for him were really working with him and that he empowered them to make their own contributions, albeit under his direction. And I'm thinking especially of Giovanni da Udine and how much latitude he was given by Raphael to in rediscover uh, Roman stucco technique and to perfect his skills at the depiction of animals and fruit and all kinds of uh, wonderful flora and fauna. And that, that aspect was, was only marginally, in a certain way, orchestrated by Raphael. He empowered Giovanni da Udine to do that. So this academia that I'm proposing would be organized according to six principles. The first one is, of course, systematicity. <laughs> Again, can't, I mean, it, I'll use William's word, uh, which has to do with uh, the methodical approach to the, the process of invention. The next is comprehensiveness, or it has to do with the scope of the artist aspirations. Raphael was celebrated by, by Vasari and others for being a universal artist, somebody who mastered all aspects of what, what he did as an artist. Um, Ingrid and I had lunch with a, an author who was here in Rome talking, uh, doing a story about Raphael for the New York Times. And um, I, I made the analogy that Raphael was like, um, a, a, a restaurant with a very rich and full menu, whereas Michelangelo was a restaurant that only served Bisteca Fiorentina. That, um, that Michelangelo's obsession was the body and especially the male body, whereas Raphael was interested in everything, male and female bodies, costume, we depicting weather, depicting every kind of material and surface, and he came earlier to architecture than Michelangelo did and, and practiced it arguably in a more complex, richer way than Michelangelo ever did because of the nature of his commissions. Um, obviously grace, and grace as the kind of essential aspect of what constitutes style. Decorum, again having to do with narrative and that narrative is really the generator of artistic form and architectural form I would argue as well. Emulation, instead of ambition, which has to, or instead of imitation, which has to do with ambition. Emulation is often used these days, you'll hear it in the media all the time. People use it as an erudite substitute for imitation, but it actually means rivaling by imitation. It's a competitive relationship with your model, not to diminish them, but to prove your own mastery and your capacity to go beyond what they did on their terms. And 
Raphael, in fact, in his career, actually himself did not practice imitation in the sense of copying very much. He drew after other artists, including Michelangelo, but he doesn't seem to have made any direct copies of other artists' work. He did, though, practice in an emulative way with respect to those artists, and I'm thinking especially of his relationship to Leonardo da Vinci's Madonna and Child. And finally, the privileging of invention. And the thing that I think we can recover that we've lost sense of because of the kind of way in which Raphael has been celebrated for so long is his sense of adventure, his sense of risk-taking, experimentation. He was sort of always operating at the edge of his abilities and, 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 and as Ingrid said, a kind of vacuum absorbing information and, and intellectual information, but also artistic information. And so he was constantly pushing the envelope. There were some who would say he went too far sometimes, especially in the, 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 the fire in the Borgo, where he may have overstepped aspects of decorum. But for him, those were all in the service of the narrative. And, and if they served the narrative, you could actually violate the decorum of grace. So what I'm going to leave you with, again, is that question about which Raphael. Apropos what Jeffrey has showed us, this is an image of the American Academy dining room in the 1920s, and it had a Raphael copy above the fireplace in good academic tradition, reverentially placed there. It was actually not the one that's there today, but in fact it was the three, three of the cardinal virtues that's on the wall of the allegory of justice. At some point, and I don't know when, but that was obviously a copy by a fellow. It was replaced by a copy by another fellow <laughs> of Poesia, um, who also sits honorifically placed above the fireplace like an ancestor, like, like a revered mentor and ancestor. And there is an aspect of um, veneration in, our, uh, in the academic relationship with Raphael. Um, the alternative to that, of course, is the pre-Raphaelites who rejected Raphael for almost all the reasons that the academics venerated him. And, 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 and essentially set him up as a kind of a nemesis um, and someone who had not saved art, but in fact had destroyed it. What I'd like to suggest is that there may be another Raphael. And it's the Raphael that we've, I would argue, rediscovered in the restoration of the frescoes in the Vatican Stanze. A Raphael who was a bravura painter in Buon Fresco. His fresco technique, like Michelangelo's, got better as he worked. And he painted in, in emulation and in many ways real competition with Michelangelo. Just like Michelangelo on the Sistine ceiling, in the School of Athens he painted whole figures in a single day. He actually painted, in some cases, multiple figures in a single day. And in this particular instance of his self-portrait, he's surrounded by three other heads, and all four of them were painted in one day. There's only so much you can do in a day, which means the way Raphael painted was effective, but it was also economical and bold and painterly. So what I'd like to suggest is that the future of Raphael is this Raphael we have rediscovered in the last several decades through the restoration of his frescoes in particular and through the scholarship of Raphael and his world that has given us a richer, more complex understanding of how he operated and, and how he got to be the person that we, we, we still venerate, but we need not treat him as inimitable. Thank you. That was the perfect wrap up. <laughs> so I would like to open it now up to questions, again, from our, our participants first, but we have quite a, a, a backlog of questions that we should take eventually. Um, so I, I would just open it up to any of, any of you all that have participated today. Um, David, can I ask you something? Please. Have you already contacted the superintendents uh, to ask? <laughs> no. You didn't? Yeah. I suspected that. Might be a difficult path. It was a, you know, in many ways, this conference began with thinking about that project, and it, it you know, that the opportunity presented itself 
because of the Raphael anniversary. And, and, and in thinking through the project, it made me think about how much we need to know about how Raphael was understood in the past and how, as Jeffrey represents, how he's been continually informative for the academic tradition, even if that's more fragile than we would like it to be. Um, but uh, but I, I, I put this all out there as a, as a, as a polemical proposition, as one that's uh, you know, subject to debate, and it, um, it, it, it takes a somewhat contrary position to other ideas about the academy. But I think that's the value of the, it, it, when, when I painted the fresco, my first fresco, I was commissioned by Joe Connors to paint the American Academy. Uh, it's an image of sleeping academia, um, because the idea of academy is in some level dormant. But the quote that Joe had me put in the fresco was, inter silvas academi quereri verum, seek for truth in the woods of academia. And the idea that, that the way an academy, a, an academy functions is ultimately through dialogue, through, and, and somewhat con contesting points of view. That, that, I think, is the fun of the academy, for me, anyway. Now, there's a question here I think is worth taking. Please. It says, how do current women artists, women artists resolve the idea of emulation of Raphael and other men with the following, that all the Renaissance artists, save one perhaps in Artemisia Gentileschi, see, it keeps moving, but let's see if I can get back to it. In any case, it's really about how do women negotiate all of this? And it was aimed, and first of all, I think there's a problem of categories that goes directly back to the way we've interpreted Vasari rather than really read him. And that's the restriction of the definition of art to painting, sculpture, and architecture. When we just heard the tapestry is highly valued, embroidery was highly valued, and in fact, Vasari talks about embroiderers. He talks about the sculptress, Perpetia dei Rossi, who did both sculpture on a colossal scale and carved peach pits with faces of 100 people. And so I think part of the way we define looking at early modern women artists is a reductive definition that we should get out of and start looking. Somebody like Sophonisma Anguissola was a painter. She's the one painter because she's female. She knows how to make lace, as do all of her sisters, as well brought up Milanese women. So if Sophonisma does a lace collar, it's a lace collar that you can actually make. And so there are whole aspects to what the artistic impulse is, where it gets expression. Agostino Chigi hires Raphael, but he also compliments his sister-in-law for sending him embroidered towels and says that he goes using them all the time for her love. And so there are all kinds of transient arts. Every altar had altar cloths that were stitched by women. And so we, by reducing what art is, I think also cut out many things that were achieved of high quality by women with an artistic purpose. I think that whole book needs to be rewritten just to start with. Then going from that basis, how do women deal with it? I think we just soldier ahead, take what's good, don't worry. Michelangelo's not my favorite, partly because he's not really looking at women. There's that whole thing about Vittoria Colonna and how great those drawings are that he does for her, which I've always thought are not his best output. But, I think human achievement should be absorbed for what it can tell us, no matter what flavor of human we are. You'll notice with David's allegories that the skin color of people is a vast variety, and that's always been the case. And so he's taken, if you actually look at Vasari, 
who was working at one point for Alessandro Medici, who was of mixed racial heritage. Vasari is very con conscious of racial mixing. There are just a whole lot of things that, looking back, can open us whole new windows. And so, in fact, I think this is a time where, rather than reject, what we have to do is redefine and really look and take inspiration. OK, the next question is for Adriano. England had a translation of Lomazzo. What did he have to say about Raphael, and was this influential? Sorry, we're going back to the detail now. Of, uh for general considerations, <laughs> I apologize. Um, I'll be short, actually. Lomazzo was, is probably the first translation ever printed in England um, of any uh, Italian treatise. This is done by Haydock in 1598, if my memory serves me right. I think it's 1598, so it's really um, the, the one and only for a very long period of time. But the impact of Haydock translation of Lomazzo is, in my, as far as I'm aware, now I should go back to the scholarship on that, is limited on 17th century England, especially because Haydock translated only the first five books of the Trattato by Lomazzo. And in the first five books of the Trattato, yes, Raphael appears, but it's not as much developed as in the whole of the book and the influence of uh, Haydock is is important on the second part of the 17th century and will re-emerge in the 18th century to the point that Hoggart is, uh, just to finish with this note, um, I don't know if you remember, in his analysis of beauty, there's the frontispiece, it's the first plate of the analysis of beauty where you have the sculpture yard with all basically classical statues and around he puts all his serpentine line and et cetera, et cetera. And on the bottom right corner of that plate in the analysis of beauty, you have uh, the mathematical artist who is there trying to basically learn the human body, uh, looking at Dürer treaty on proportions and reading Lomazzo. And of course, for, uh, uh, for Hoggart who advocated a completely different approach to the learning of art coming especially from the life model, these were the two enemies in a way, the proportional drawings of Dürer and the intellectual approach of Lomazzo is exactly what should be in a way rejected by young training artists. But this is just to say that yes, in the 18th century, that translation of Lomazzo had a reception, but to be honest, I don't know how much that contributed to the uh, success of Raphael in the, in the 18th century in England. Thank you. The next question comes from a student in South Bend. Uh, today's fine art academies and ateliers seem to reflect the 19th and 20th century model of hyperrealism in academic art. This can perhaps be an effect of the obsession of pedagogical perfection. How should art and architecture schools refocus on their teaching to include invention and adventure in their works? for uh, Professor Mims. Can you hear me now? Yes. It's a great question and it's something that anybody who's in this field has certainly noticed. Now it's been such a struggle Adriano, can we can we put the blame on Hogarth to have started modernism? I don't know if we will go that far. <laughs> but are we been... necessarily against modernism? Personally, I'm not. So I, I personally think that uh, the, the teaching method at the Bauhaus by Johannes Sitten or Gropius or Breuer or the constructivists had much more to say than the Victorian academies in the 1920s. So that's my personal point of view. So uh, it's, and I really believe that some of the essential traits uh, of classicism are within early modernism uh, and, and certainly not in eclectic architecture of the late 19th century. So I think, that, you see what I mean? We should be, it's difficult. <laughs> but we're certainly given David what he wanted and that was the um, 
polemical arguments that we might get into later. We'll hold off on that. <laughs> um, th the question about perfection of realism in contemporary ateliers and academies is one that I think is a great question because that's about as far as things have gone, but it has been such a struggle to learn the very basics of representational work that, that very few people have thought beyond the magic of illusion into the deeper purposes of art. That is a question of design. That's a question of studying the history of art thoroughly to have a better sense of building a vocabulary that will allow imagination and invention. That is yet to be seen. Thank you. The next question is, moving forward, which lessons can we take from Raphael's own emulation of antiquity? In particular, his emulation of Roman frescoes and grotesques, such as those in the Domus Aurea. This is for whomever would like to answer. David, you're on mute, I think. Yeah. Okay. So. Okay. <laughs> Um, so the, the relationship with antiquity is an interesting one because, you know, the, the reality is for the, okay, the, for the painters of the Renaissance, there was almost, there was very little ancient painting that survived or that what they had access to. What they had were the so-called, you know, the grotesques. Um, so the relationship with antiquity for a painter was different than, than it would be for a sculptor. With respect to the decoration of the Domus Aurea, you do there, there have a very direct case of, uh, of, of almost more imitative, I would argue, relationship with antiquity than emulative in the sense that um, Raphael's iterations of that kind of painting are, are, are the, maybe some of the closest examples we have from, let's call it the High Renaissance, of, of, of a kind of an almost neoclassical uh, evocation of antiquity, because the example was so direct, because they, they could essentially copy it so so more you know literally if you like, um, and and so there's an interesting I think difference between let's say the school of Athens, um, for which Raphael had no antique model that he could look to, and the loggia of the Villa Madama, which in every way is an attempt to literally recreate an ancient Roman space, as to a certain extent Bermonte had done at his loggia at Genizano. Um, so I think it's an interest that, that there, there's, Raphael's relationship with antiquity is complex because of the fragmentary nature of the antiquity he had available to him. And it's interesting that the things he, that were most inventive were the places where he had fewer examples to work from. Yeah, I also think any time a Medici gets mixed up in it, it gets boring really fast. And this Leo X obviously bores him to tears. And I think Cardinal Giulio is a little bit more interesting, but the people who are getting really interesting creative stuff out of him are Agostino Chigi and Julius II. Yeah, it's interesting that the Villa Farnesina the loggia is not uh, an, an al, it's not really al antica in a in, in the way that the loggia of the Villa Madama is, and it could have been. I mean, you could imagine Raphael doing the loggia of the Villa Farnesina in a completely other manner, much more ancient in its source, but he he didn't. Yes, I think Agostino just wants to go forward. <laughs> Do we have another question? We have a short question uh, for you, David. Um, are there any books published on Raphael's house uh, on Via Giulia? 
Um, so what I know about it is from Frommel. Um, so f I think in, uh, where there's Raphael Architetto, um, which, which has the, the original plans, and, and the drawings, so the, the, the image I gave you was essentially drawn from Frommel's history of um, Re Renaissance architecture. And uh, he's essentially, he's sort of redrawn the plans that we have, which were probably actually drawn by um, Antonio da Sangallo the Younger. I think they were not in Raphael's hand. Um, the extent to which Sangallo had some influence on the plan is, is an interesting question. It's the same question for the Villa Madama. Um, but I don't know, it, there's not enough of it really to build a book around. But um, I, think it, 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 I think it merits an article at least, and someone could write it. I, I, and I do think that there's a, there's a quote from Aretino that I'm not gonna remember well. Um, but, but whenever, uh, Aretino says something to the effect of, when you wanna know something uh, about a person, look at their house, because the house is essentially a reflection of who they are. Um, and I do think that that house is a portrait of Raphael and his interest, and it is, I think, quite directly related to the portrait with arguably Giulio Romano, that the house is a kind of self-portrait in an architectural form. Um, and and that, that aspect, I think, could be developed Maybe Ingrid and I will write this. <laughs> I would be fun to just do it. And I, it's never been reconstructed in elevation. I mean, I, I, I checked Frommel's assumption that the, that the pilasters were for a colossal order, and they are gigantic, so they, they do measure out to something that would span through two stories. What order they would be? If, uh, if Raphael is going to build a house for himself and wrap it in colossal pilasters, which order should it be? Oh, it needs to be pontifical rustication with Tuscan column and Doric frieze. Okay. So that, that I think, it, uh, an article could be built around the reconstruction of that house in elevation and in section. Or his side will be that, and Julio's Julia. side will be completely insane. <laughs> so we'll take those ionic columns that become a window frame. <laughs> This is the fun. I mean, that I think, and this is a lot. I, if I can leave it because we're near the end of our time, but if I could leave with that interesting thought, that sometimes too much knowledge is um, an impediment to the evolution of a tradition. Knowing too much can actually be a burden. Um, Bernini cautioned the, the the students at the new Roman, uh, the French Academy in Rome of not spending the whole day copying because it gives you a hard and dry style. You have to balance copying with invention. And I, and I do think there, where there is room for invention is all those gaps that we have in the knowledge where we have to make up what we don't know. Um, it's the kind of thing that historians often don't do because it goes against their professional code of ethics. But we artists and architects don't have that code. So we, we boldly go where no one has gone before. Um, and I think, there, but I think the collaboration that Ingrid and I talked about when we first met that we've never done is the reconstruction of the facades of the Villa Farnesina. Um, there is a lot of fruitful interaction, I think, potentially between historians and artistic practitioners in the realm of that gap of missing information. Uh, where the historical record is incomplete and to what extent can an artist, a contemporary artist like Jeffrey Mims, who is fully immersed and a master of that tradition, can he help fill in some of that missing information? And I think, I would hope that that's something we can hope, we can hope for in the future. Um, if, if that can be a last word, um, I will thank those of you who stuck with us through all this. Um, this will also be available on YouTube afterwards, and we do hope to put together a more condensed documentary version of this for wider dissemination, and so I will ask you to stay tuned for that. But thank you all of you who, who participated, uh, who asked questions, and who watched with us. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. The YouTube link has been posted in the uh, Zoom chat, if you need to refer to it.